What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This episode number 718. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your limited resources, and joining me on the line all the way from Denver, Colorado, it's Luis Scott Vargas. Luis, we actually got to hang out a little bit this weekend. Yeah, it was it was cool. Me, 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 you, Paul, and Monty got to go to an all you can eat sushi place where I, I'd say that we acquitted ourselves nicely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they they saw us walk in and it was like fine. And then we started ordering and they're like, oh no, we're gonna we're gonna lose it on these guys. <laughs> Um, no, it, it was actually like the opposite. The, the guy was like, all right, anything else? More, more. Come on, just get you know, He, he get was me. encouraging, yeah. Yeah, that was And then, that was and pretty then we cool. went to the um, popsicle place. Uh, Paletta? Oh, yeah, that was the Paletas. Yeah, that, that was great, man. We went to a place. We were in Las Vegas uh, for the World Championship. Luis, was, Luis and I are actually both working the event in, in different degrees. And, um, yeah, we found a place that Cedric recommended – uh, and that was actually the second time I'd gone in. You get to pick like a like a creamsicle popsicle type thing where you pick the flavor and they have like 20 of them. And then they like dip it in stuff and roll it around. And it's really, really good. I, I kind of wish we had one of those here now. But uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed it quite a bit. And, uh, you know, it was almost as good as the company. <laughs> yes, you had good company too. But anyway, we had a, a great trip. And of course, uh, Luis and I actually got to hang out in real life, which doesn't happen all the time. So that was really cool. Um, and we've got a few little tidbits from the World Championship as far as limited goes for Wilds of Eldraine as well. We're also going to do one of our favorite things. We're going to continue our Vintage Cube set review series. We've already done white and we're going to do blue. This is where we go over each and every card. And we put them through a little bit of a different lens than we do the set reviews. Um, but uh, but yeah, we think it's more useful for people who are cubing to, to view them that way. And uh, we're going to do that again for arguably the most important color in Vintage Cube, blue today. Before we do, I want to thank our patrons over on patreon.com. Uh, ours is patreon.com slash limited resources. And it's a way that you can support the show, either this one or other content creators that you love. Uh, really great way to get direct contact with them and also to um, support them directly. So if you're interested in, you know, keeping the shows and podcasts and music and the stuff that you really love going, Patreon is often a really great place to do so. We have uh, it's set up so that you get a thank you card as well as a sticker in the mail, no matter what level you sign up for, just as our way of saying thank you to you. And then of course you get access to the Patreon feed, which is where we post our Patreon question of the week thread, as well as questions for our guests, or if we would just want to ask our most dedicated listeners things directly, that's where we put it. This one comes from Tim who says, hello, gents, I'm having this tradition of running a birthday draft with my friends for my birthday party. And last time we tried to, we tied a trim a team draft. It was a total mess. At least for me, I went 03 and my team lost the whole draft. Any advice on how to approach a team draft to make it first of all fun and secondly, how to be successful in it. And he says, thanks for everything you're doing and wish you all the best. Thank you, Tim. Kind of funny. A uh, team draft doesn't really maximize for fun. Does it Luis? Uh, I mean, I'm not saying it's not fun, but depends on your definition of fun. I don't know. I think it's pretty I mean, objectively like cut it, like hurting other people <laughs> as part of the basic mechanic is I, a little, a little less fun than trying to do creative, cool things on your own, I guess. But I find team dress to be way more fun than individual. <laughs> you have a team you're rooting for, but you, but you can have both, right? What do you mean? Well, I'm talking about like the difference between team drafting where the teams are set before or after the draft. <clears throat> oh, I think it's way more fun to have teams in the draft because I think that the draft is a lot more interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. I find it, I find adding that strategic depth and complexity is in, increases my level of fun while playing it. You I don't get do, that. That's weird to me. Uh, I mean, it's it, not just complexity though. It, it's like taking away, like you have to make picks that suck for your deck in order to you basically have to throw away some number of picks, right? No, you're, you're, you're right. You would enjoy basketball a lot more if it was all free throws and no one was trying to block your shots. I, I, I see that. Come on. I still have That's to play. That's what we're talking about. No, we're not. I still have to play my games against an opponent. It's hard enough. <laughs> like all I you're doing is taking some percentage of picks that you would normally be making with the intent of p potentially putting in your deck or maybe splashing or something and just ripping them up just for the sake of they don't get this card. That's not I mean, that there's fun. Some, there's some of that, but uh, I think it's a little it's 
complex well, enough that it's I wouldn't say it's just that. And in in and after the draft picks, there's none of that. You can just you're free to sculpt your masterpiece however you see fit with no <laughs> no recourse against you. I, you, I don't you know. know it, 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 what's even what's even more free is if you do sealed deck. Then no one takes any of your cards. You just have all of your cards. You can yeah, I mean, sealed deck's okay too, but... Uh, and I think you might enjoy a 12, 18 pack sealed, so you just have even better decks. Like, I mean, I, I've played them. They're okay. <laughs> I, I, I do like a little bit of a challenge, but I mean, you only get three booster packs in a draft. It's like, it's already tough. It's well, not like you're coming away with build your deck perfect you decks every to... time if you draft, like, even in a league, you don't end up with that. And, and those people aren't cutting any cards you know yeah i mean but e even in an eight player draft people take cards they think they're going to play a red card and they take it from you and mm -hmm. then they end up not playing red or trust me people hate draft in in draft leagues plenty <laughs> like yeah I mean, we get enough questions though, about even that, though we tell that, them not to yeah that it, it's pretty clear you know so but at yeah, any rate I, yeah I, I i think that at least for tradition like it, it is a burden in my mind it, it can be an interesting burden um, and you know, obviously it, it suits your approach, but I don't know I, when I, you know, I watch your, all your videos and they are all, basically all team draft and they're all, uh, players are determined before. And just to, to clarify that, by the way, there are two ways to do team drafts that there's where, you know, who's on your team. You're always passing to somebody who's going to be an opponent. And then the other way to do it is to sit down and draft normally, and then you randomly pick the teams after the draft's already finished, so there isn't this dynamic of like trying to cut everybody off and, and take cards that you're not going to use for, for your own deck. Uh, that, that's just a clarification of what I meant by that. Um, I don't remember what I was going to say before that, though. Uh, I, I, oh, yeah, I was saying it's, 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 it feels more like a burden. Like It, couldn't, it can be interesting, um, but I have a hard time thinking that it's, I don't know, the traditional definition of fun well, at least i mean you might be part kind of, of it, crazy part of it for me like uh you know I, I was obviously taking slight creative liberties when i said you'd enjoy basketball more if people weren't trying to block your shot mm -hmm. there is some element of that where like when i end up with a sweet deck in a team draft i feel more accomplished than if it was an eight player draft and that is part of the fun for me like being able to pull that off even when people are trying to stop you yeah i i guess for me like i think of it in terms of like the decks on average are less coherent right you're you're having to play worse cards worse fixing less combos you know that kind of stuff so there's yeah. certainly a, I, I definitely understand the challenge of it i guess i just don't see regular draft as being like unchallenging you know i don't like if i go for a combo deck in a vintage cube league I, it's not like it just gets handed to me right like i'm already kind of on the ropes to try to get my deck together. And, you know, also I do wonder, I don't, I, I, I wonder, this is sort of a, a side tangent, but we are going to be talking about vintage cube is how much do you think people are hate drafting from you these oh, days in there? Like, a, like not letting you have Academy or the, the cards that you win with a good amount. I, I, I know it's happened because we've mm -hmm. talked about it. Okay. Yeah. So that's interesting too. At any rate, but you find it more fun, at least more interesting, more dynamic than non. Yeah. Okay. So what would you say to Tim? Well, <laughs> honestly, at the experience level Tim's at, I wouldn't say there's anything different from a team draft, really. Just work on your drafting skills. You didn't go 03 because you're not a team draft. You went 03 because draft is hard. Mm -hmm. And any kind of draft is hard. Like you, My guess is you aren't at the point where you're benefiting from specific team draft preparation more than just learning how to draft. Mm -hmm. Because... I look when you take two players of equal skill who are experts and one's done a bunch of team drafts, like let's say me versus someone who doesn't do a bunch of team drafts. Yeah. I'll be a little better at team draft because I've done a bunch of them. Right. But when you picked, let's say you pick two people who from the top eight of, a, of the last grand prix, right? The one in Vegas, the hundred K mm -hmm. those two people will still be good at team draft, even if they've never done one before, because they are good at limited. You had to be good at limited to go, you know, 13 and two or whatever to top eight, the, the right. Grand Prix. So I would say the, the short version is don't pass any rares that are like unbeatable. And that's like the quick and dirty, like what, how you can team draft. Otherwise just focus on drafting a good deck. And just like, if you know the format, just try to draft a good deck. You do. It's, we spent a lot of time talking about the difference between team and normal draft, but at the end of the day, it's, it's a pretty marginal difference 
it's, especially with current mastered. sets. We're talking about small edges. It's like you wouldn't you wouldn't tell someone in basketball to practice their crossover skills if they don't know how to shoot the basketball. Right. 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 Like you, you need to get to point uh, from point A to point B before right. you work on point Z, which team draft is closer to point Z than point A. So right. Yeah, Honestly, and it's, especially familiar, with current yeah. level sets, right? Like where there's so many more playables, it's it's even if you're kind of train wreck a little bit, you'll usually have cards you can cast that actually affect the board. Yeah, right? and I think that you're not. It used to be more so that you could train wreck someone by cutting them off, but mm -hmm. in the current sets, it's going to be pretty difficult to do. So awesome that you're team drafting. The more you do it, the more you'll learn about it. But in general, I would say besides trying to like not pass any particularly good rares or maybe trying to, to to put the person next to you into the same colors by like taking a good black card over a decent black card with no other good colors in the pack. That's kind of the dream. Mm -hmm. you, you really should just kind of draft your deck. Just try to draft your deck the best as possible. Yeah. I, I, I would say you should try what, what I had put up because look, I mean, at the end of the day, if you, if you know the teams before the draft, people are going to be actively trying to take cards from the other team that is to the detriment of the decks, at least, of both teams. Um, it might be fun to try to figure out the delta, right? To try to maximize the difference between your worst deck and their worst deck than it would have been. Uh, and if that's what your group is into, like Luis's, then that's you should do that. Um, and I don't have any advice how to make it more fun beyond that. But if your group wants to draft something that looks more like a, a normal deck, but then play in a team setting where you can help each other build, you can offer play advice depending on what your rules are at your house, and you can celebrate the victory together as a team with all the pressures and fun that comes of being on a team, which that's the part I really, really like about team draft the most, then you can sit down, randomize the seating, however, do a whole draft and then if you've got six players, you know, randomize it so that three are on one team and three are on the other. And then it takes away that sort of race to the bottom where everybody's kind of cutting each other. Um, and But it still gives you the team elements if that's the part that, that you like. So that's what I'd say, Tim. Um, but, you know, people have been doing team drafts the way that Luis described it for years and years and years. And it's very deep, very fun uh, experience. You know, it, it, I wouldn't say that it maximizes purely for enjoyment. It, it's sort of a cutthroat kind of a, a way to play. But if, you know, but that might be what your, uh, your play group is about as well. And if so, then just keep battling and you'll get better at it. Um, all right, let's do a Wilds of Eldraine crack -a pack real quick here, Louisa. It's still early enough in the format that I wanted to, to stick with the crack -a pack, even though we're going to be talking about cube after um, we talk about one more archetype for wild. So our first card is misleading moats. That's the, the three and a blue instant removal spell. It's passable, but not particularly good. I, I think it's passable in the sense of like, we can pass it to the person sitting to our left snare master Sprite. Oh, well, another card. That's just not very good. Like no. this card would have been good if the, the theme was good, but yes. I don't think it is good. Yeah. Finally, we have a one drop. That isn't very good. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> uh, next is Red Cap Thief. That's the the two and a red two three that makes treasure. Red Cap Thief is all right. I don't yeah. mind playing it. I mean, I would hope not to take it particularly early, but it it's all right. Uh, Hollow Scavenger. That that's the two and a green three two that you could sack foods to pump it, and it also makes a food for G. Yeah, totally fine card as well. Yeah, I like that card a lot. Um, Scream Puff, replaceable five drop edge wall pack. This card's been good. That's the 300, 3 3 menace that makes a 1 1 rat. Yeah. Um, I think I would be on Hollow Scavenger, but it's close. I think I would take Hollow Scavenger, but I would, again, hope not to take any of these cards. Yeah. Are you a wolf or a dog? kind of guy you know that's the question uh, I, I would cons I consider myself a lone wolf <laughs> <laughs> what is uh what is all never wants to go out to dinner with me so <laughs> what is what is uh julie uh Ju oh julie's a dog, dog. Sure. She is not a wolf. dog. <laughs> no menace though um next is break the spell which is the one that destroys an enchantment and hasn't really been a thing uh curse of the were fox that's the 2g make a monster roll and then it fights Sorcery yeah, speed. This okay. one's okay. Yeah. I find it to be all right. I still would take Hollow Scavenger over it, though. And then there's Vantress Transmuter. That's the 
three and a blue, three, four vanilla, but it also has croaking curse, which is the one and a blue tap target creature and create a cursed roll attached to it. These are all just marginal playables that yeah. I'm really not looking to to run if I can avoid it. All right. Can I upgrade you to a Lord Skitter's Butcher? That's the two and a black, two, three, and you can either make a rat, sack a creature, describe to and draw a card, or give your creatures a menace until in a turn when it ETBs. Yeah, I would be in for that. I mean, yeah. I think this is the best card so far. Black's a good color to start with. And this is kind of like an edge wall pack for just one less mana with some other flexibility going on. So yeah, I'd be totally in for that. Uh, graceful takedown, one in a green sorcery. Any number of target enchanted creatures, you can turn them up to one other target creature. Each bites something. I do like that one more than Curse of the Were Fox, just because it's cheaper and uh -huh. isn't a fight and all that. It has that but, upside, yeah. Yeah, but uh, I, I think I'd still take Lord Skater's Butcher. I'm not sure. Okay, yeah, I would. That's right, yeah. But this next one I would take over it. It's Welcome to Sweet Tooth. Oh, yeah. fantastic card. This is yeah. the this is the first card I'd be happy to take here. Like yeah. I would be I would be thrilled to be like, yep, I'm, I'm in. I would definitely be taking this. We do have a rare. Actually, we have two rares. We have Blind Obedience from the bonus sheet, which is the Extort uh, enchantment. It's a good card. I do think it's good, but it's Welcome to Sweet Tooth is just it's Welcome to Sweet Tooth is two mana for like four mana worth of cards. Yeah, it really you does. You can't over pass that up. I mean, I think it's if not the best green uncommon, it's in that top echelon of green uncommon. Yeah, it might be. I can't. What, what was the other? Oh yeah. I mean, the, the, Agatha's Champion and uh, Tough Cookie and, are and, all, and, and Welcome to Sweet Tooth are all in the same kind of tier of like uh, about sixty percent win per, game and yeah, hand win percentage. Super good. And I find all of them to be like, yes, I am happy to open this in first pick it. Can I interest you in a Gruff Triplets at the rare slot? <laughs> well, yeah, <sure. laughs> All right. So Everyone we finally price, opened so. the best card. All right. It's Gruff Triplets. That's the best card in the set. So we will we will be taking that. Okay. Before we uh, get into the uh, blue review for the Vintage Cube, I did want to mention a potential metagame shift that we saw at the uh, World Championship. I had a short conversation. I, I Maybe we should get him on or something to talk a little bit more at some point about Limited. But uh, Carl Serap, one of the World championship competitors and a, and he's a good limited player he he takes it very seriously he um caught me just for a minute and said that he felt that blue white was underrated and maybe a bit misunderstood and i was like okay you know i'm and what he told me was that it performed pretty well not top top but pretty well at their house drafts or team drafts that they did not, not that type of team draft, sorry, the testing team drafts that they did yeah. leading up to the world championship. So this was a group of players who were all testing for the world championship of which limited was a very big part. And he said that blue white actually had a pretty decent win rate in the house there. Also a little bit more evidence. Again, this is a sp specific group of players under certain circumstances. So I don't know if that affects things, but there were, I think 12 pods it might have been 10 actually i believe there were 10 no it must have been 12 whatever some number i think it's 10 or 12 pods in day one of the tournament something like that anyway and two of the 3-0 decks so each one of those pods will produce a 3-0 player uh were blue white and that's at the world championship where everybody kind of knows what they're doing at the very least and some you know extremely talented accomplished limited players there as well. So it's like, okay, you know, what's, what's going on here? And uh, basically what he said was that the archetype isn't about tapping. We were lied to. We were misled. The signpost led us off of a cliff in this case. Uh, really what, what actually happened was is that the archetype just didn't work. I, I think that they intended for it to work. It just didn't for whatever reason. It's not powerful enough or whatever. And uh, that the deck actually plays out fairly well as more of a mid-range leaning control value deck. Um, the type of thing where it's got decent removal and creature interaction, it's got pretty darn good card draw, and it has the ability to prolong the game long enough to take advantage of those. And, you know, it's got some flyers and just some random commons that are kind of big and have adventure spells on them that you can use to clean up the board and, uh, and win the game. 
Have you seen this around? Have you heard this? The, the rumors of blue white actually being okay if you if you just ignore the whole tapping theme. I mean, I've been drafting that for a while. Like that, a mm -hmm. lot of the decks I draft, especially if I start with like early hatching plans or expel the interlopers, is just blue white control that plays Sheree, the uncommon tapper, the two three for four. Mm -hmm. It's just a good value card, but mm -hmm. doesn't really play the tap theme. And I haven't tried to lean into that really at all. But Kellen's Light Blades plus a bunch of, you know, decent uh, just removal spells and interaction and card draw, I think works out fairly nicely. And blue white is one, certainly one of the colors I don't mind drafting. Yeah, it's just and, and I, you know, you said you didn't really lean into the tapping theme, but I think, you know, maybe better would be to just like actively ignore it. Right. Like, yeah. are there any of those cards that you actually want? The ones that are just like about tapping, you know, tapping things down the, the fairy that we picked up in our crack a pack, that kind of thing. I, I want charade. Cause again, it's an uncommon that it's a yeah. four mana two, three that taps and draws like that is just a good deal. Mm -hmm. But other than that, but no, like the I'm spells not, that tap. No, I'm not really in, in yeah. any of those. Yeah. Uh, I have an example of a deck that did well in the hands of, of, our friend Paul Chion, who uh, bravely oh, must be really good. Yeah, he bravely tested out the uh, the theory. And by the way, he you know was preparing for uh, coverage at the World Championship, and he his he was like fifth in limited, like mythic fifth or whatever. So he like definitely put in the the time. And here I'm going to read you the the deck in order. And there, and if you're on YouTube, you can see it on your screen. So two cooped up, a hopeful vigil. Two Kellen's Light Blades, a Hatching Plans, a Picklock Prankster, a Storm Keld Prowler, and three Bowls of Porridge at the two drop slot. Threes are Stockpiling Celebrant, Ice Rot Sentry, Tenacious Tome Seeker, and Ice Out. Fours are three copies of Johan's Stopgap, as well as Charay of Numbing Depths that you mentioned, Louise. The fives are, oh, there it is, Expel the Interlopers as well as two copies of Into the Fey Court, the draw three. And then the six drop slot is three copies of Baluna's Gatekeeper. That's the six mana, six five, but you can pay one and a blue to bounce a three drop or less uh, creature. And so those end up slotting in at the two a lot of times and then coming down at the five. And obviously, you know, those type of cards sort of naturally... Um, work in the sense that like they buy you the time to get to the six man and start deploying, you know, big, dumb six fives. Um, and then in this case, Paul played seven planes and seven islands as well as a forest uh, and then splashed for a, a restless vine stock and an evolving wilds to activate it for the forest, which I thought was kind of interesting, but yeah, in any I've rate, done that with uh, some of the creature lands, they're, they're good enough to, yeah, to actually splash. Yeah. And I don't know, there was a, a great, um, moment on coverage where Chris, oh, uh, who was it actually? Hmm. It's actually uh, escaping me who it was, but use Brave the Wilds to to wake up. I think it actually was a Restless Vine stock hmm. in Limited. And it's interesting because it doesn't, it's still just a 3-3, three, three, but it does retain any of the static ability. So like when it attacks, turns something into a 3-3. Three, three even if you woke it up using Brave the Wilds, which is kind of interesting, and it stays woken up. You don't have to pay over and over again. Uh, but at any rate, so this is just an example of this type of deck. So I wanted to put it on the radar because this, at least to me, is one of those ones that can kind of slip through the cracks if you're, if you're relying too much either on 17 lands data, which will tell you that many of these, th this color pair is the worst and also not very good, but that's because probably people are trying to do the tapper thing. Um, so that's kind of the main thing, but also, yeah, you know, we use the signpost uncommons as a guide, but sometimes there's an archetype hidden within an archetype. And that seems to be the case here. Yeah. And in this case, it's just that like blue and white have decent enough control cards and blue is underdrafted by a mm -hmm. decent amount. White is also a little underdrafted and especially blue plus white combined. I mean, Charay is splashable and Threadbind Click is splashable, but you will get those cards later than if they were the exact same text box, but a different color pair. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's something to try out in the Wilds of Eldraine queues. Uh, if you haven't tried it out yet, try blue-white control, but don't go all in on the tapping thing. In fact, you kind of tend to avoid it unless it's something relatively free like Charay. Okay, Luis, this is it. 
our uh, vintage cube set review has uh, we, we've already done white and now we get to do blue. <laughs> so uh, before we dive into the actual cards, I did want to ask you, is blue still the best, most important color in the vintage cube in your mind? No, I don't think blue is the best color. Um, I think blue is very good. And I think that blue has the best, some of the best cards. Like Time Walk, I think, is actually the best card in the cube. Like it's my pick one, pack one of the entire cube. If I could just decide which card to start with, it actually would be Time Walk. I think it's okay. I think it's better than Lotus, better than Soaring. You have to draft around it. I like drafting those kinds of decks, whatever. But blue used to be, for most of the cube's existence, like 20 years, right, as people started cubing in like the early 2000s, blue was kind of like, oh, yeah, this is the best color. Obviously, blue is the best, et cetera. I don't really think that's the case anymore. I think that you could make an argument that white's the best color, which is funny because it used to be the worst, maybe Mm -hmm. because, you know, people have still in that mindset. But like white weenie still is just maybe the best deck or one of the best decks. White also has a lot of great control cards, you know, balance, swords to plowshares, cards like the Wandering Emperor, which play both sides, Skyclave Apparition, a lot of really good cards. And I I mean, I think like in terms of color order, I think green is the worst color. And I think like white, black and blue are very, very good. And I think red is actually a little bit worse than those, but it's cube. All the, all the cards are really good and all the colors are really good. So there's no color in cube where I'm like, I, you know, someone's like, I drafted this and I'm like, oh man, that was a mistake. That the cube doesn't have to be like that, you know? Right. But, but is blue the undisputed, you know, top of the heap? No, I don't, I don't think so. Yeah. And I think. And like you said, it used to be. It used to be, yes. Um, But it's certainly not. Okay. Well, let's get into it. We're going to go by the same groupings we did before, which is we're going to run through the creatures, planeswalkers, instants, sorceries, and then anything that's left over after that. And uh, we're going to do them by mana cost. And then what we'll do is we'll talk about what decks these cards are in, what decks want them, or why you would pick the card. We'll also give it, we're, we don't give it the same grades that we gave before, but we're going to mark it whether it's a, a you know replacement level or if it's premium or if it's even a card that we haven't found much success with or that shouldn't really be in your deck that often. And then uh, of each grouping, so like the two drop creatures, for example, we'll pick a goat. We'll pick one that's kind of the one that defines it for us or the one that we want the most. So first card up is Baral, Chief of Compliance. Uh, Brawl's, I think, one of the cards that is actually the least likely to stay to be in the cube in like like the next in any given iteration. Mm-hmm. It's just a weak card. Like, yeah, the idea is kind of that Brawl lets you combo off, but the reality of the situation is that you don't really want your combo deck to rely on a creature. Brawl doesn't reduce the cost of everything. It's just a kind of tricky card to use, and as a result, I don't find Brawl to be too important for most decks. Like, it's. It's a card you'll play in some decks, but you don't even play it in all your combo decks. So I think Brawl is actually pretty, pr- pretty near the edge end of the line here. <laughs> yeah, the only deck that wants it are combo decks. But as you mentioned briefly, there, you know, combo decks tend to play not that many creatures, and if they yeah. do play them, they're proxies for spells. And Brawl is neither of those. And so you just have to run your Brawl out there, and then your opponent, who is going to be packing some amount of creature removal in the average deck, goes, oh, well, there's a target. And if you just skip the Brawl step and just add another spell to your deck, then they don't have a good target for their removal spell, and you can just sort of take it out of their hand. So if Brawl gave you more, it might be worth it, but it, it just doesn't. Uh, new addition, Fairy Mastermind. How have you liked Fairy Mastermind in Vintage Cube? I like it a lot. Fairy Mastermind is nice because it... It's good against card draw spells. It's also just like a cheap little flyer. And one of the things that I like blue when it is able to lean into, I like when blue can lean into this like aggressive uh, small creature, like blue red tempo, blue black tempo style deck. Cards mm-hmm. where like Fallen Shinobi is good or, you know, any sort of like red blue Goblin Rabble Master with plus Mana Leak, Force of Will type stuff. And uh, Fairy Mastermind fits perfectly into that. Like it's a good card in almost any deck that can add blue mana. So I think that that is the sign of a card I'm like pretty happy to see. Okay, so not an archetype specific card. It's just kind of a general catch-all that if you can cast it and you need a playable at two, then it's fine. I mean, people do like to draw a bunch of extra cards in the cube and there's a tons of cards that do it and across the color spectrum. So Fairy Mastermind's pretty good. Next one's a big one, Jace Vryn's Prodigy, JVP. 
JVP is great. Uh, I I don't mind taking JVP early. I tend to not take Jace um, unless I have a good spell, unless it's a, obviously like if it's a bad pack, it's a bad pack. So be it. But uh, for the most part, I think Jace is just going to be good in most blue decks. It's just a strong card for two mana. You end up getting to do some looting and then eventually replay something strong. So yeah, the, the archetype. Deal. Yeah, the archetypes that I find that want this this card the most, though it is it, it can go into basically anything because looting is just good in any archetype. But it's particularly good in uh, in reanimator. This is a very nice two drop right, does for double duty there. Right, it does double duty for reanimator. And then, as you mentioned, you know, having a premium spell, ancestral or time walk or something to flash back uh, that's cheap. And good, even something like Thought Seize or whatever, those are all desirable uh, for sure. But, you know, the blue red deck or a deck that is spell heavy also can just take advantage of this. And even if it's just a lightning bolt or something that you're flashing back, that's fine too. Um, but, you know, the you like Time Walk, right? Ancestral, those are the stuff that, that really pop off with, with JVP. Um, also, a play that I keep seeing your opponents make against you in your cubes is to flip them on end step. <laughs> yeah why, no, why are do they that. doing that that's that's the same as like end of your turn wasteland your land like you, right. you just shouldn't do that right like you're not getting any advantage out of doing that okay so so just uh yeah if if you if you are going to flip it just wait till your turn so you can get the extra draw step and then when you loot you'll have a little bit more information about what to get rid of uh ledger shredder this is a card that i know i've seen you play it quite a bit at least before although maybe a little less um recently where are you at on the shredder shredder's good it's a solid card i mean it's it's good enough to play in basically any blue deck, but it's a card I like taking around fifth, sixth pick most of the time. Like it just, it can be a little low impact though. I mean, the card can be great when you play it on turn two and then play a Gitaxian probe and it's just a two, four, and then maybe they double spell all of a sudden you spent two mana for a four or six flyer. That, mm -hmm. That's awesome. What, what archetype wants it the most? I mean, this is technically another reanimator thing. Uh, it is good in reanimator, but reanimator doesn't always multi-spell as, right. as easily. It, it is great in blue red. Like again, mm -hmm. the blue red tempo deck or blue black, but both those decks can be pretty good or blue. white. actually blue. It's funny. Blue, blue, white can be aggressive too. imagine a blue white deck that has like blade splicer restoration angel, kind of like the blink thing. Benser ledger shredder fits kind of nicely into that as well. Okay. Uh, next is phantasmal image card's been around for a while now, but it definitely pulls its weight. It's interesting because to me, this is one of the two drops that has the biggest range, right? There's games where it just really doesn't do much of anything, or if it does do something, it's kind of minimal. And there's games where it's like, are you serious right now? <laughs> like You copied yeah. their reanimated thing, or you reanimated a thing and then copied the thing again. And it's just like, what is happening? You get an image for only two. Of course, the the conceit to to phantasmal image in an environment like Vintage Cube is that almost every creature has an enter the battlefield uh, trigger of some sort or something for for you know basically resolving it, putting it on the battlefield, and you can piggyback off that with the phantasmal image. And then if they kill it, meh, so be it. Yeah, and phantasmal image is another one of those cards where like if your deck has good targets for it, then I'm really happy to play this card. Mm. And I don't like taking it when I've got no ways to use it, basically. So you don't want to rely on your opponent to produce targets. Yeah. Look, a lot of the time you do play it uh, on your opponent's stuff, but having cards that for you to copy means it's way less of a risk of it just being dead. Okay. Uh, next is Snappy, Snapcaster Mage. Snapcaster Mage is great. It's kind of like JVP. Like, yeah. if I already have a Swords to Plowshares, an Ancestral Recall, you know, Thought Seize plus uh, Fatal Push, like, those kind of cheap spells, Preordain Ponder, I'll actively go after these. Will I take Snapcaster, pick one, pack three, when, let's say I have, like, just a blue card that's not a good spell? Like, let's say I, I, let's say I took Pluto Delta and, and Subtlety. Would I take snapcaster mage eh, i mean i might but it wouldn't be like at the top of my list but in a game where i or a draft where i started with let's say my first two picks were swords to plowshares into counter spell yeah i'm, I'm snapping up the snapcaster as it were yeah. also it works with counters which J jvp doesn't really work with counters um what decks want snapcaster mage decks of cheap spells yeah. i mean any of those decks yeah. uh, another card that's good in like the the blue red deck where you can burn them out yep uh, Thieving Skydiver is our last blue two-drop creature. Thieving Skydiver is great. 
I, I put it into basically any deck. If if you're unlucky enough to not open power, then you know, <laughs> steal you, some. <laughs> you, you, you can always steal some, and it yeah. actually works out pretty nicely. Yeah, this is a, a an environment specific to thieving skydiver, but you know, artifacts are heavily heavily played. There's the full set of Mox, and there's the you know cheap uh, accelerating stuff like mana vault and those type of things. There's a lot of targets, even just at the three mana slot for thieving skydiver. You, you can't pay zero. So you do have to wait till you get up three. It can be a little bit slow, but then you get this nice body left over Two one flyers, good at pressuring planeswalkers or life totals or, you know, chump blocking 2020s or whatever. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely held its own. The premium ones for me, I think would be JVP phantasmal image and snapcaster. I would give GOAT award probably to JVP, I think, in this category. Yeah, I would I would give it to Jace Finn's Prodigy. Yeah. What do you think? I think so, because it it's very similar to Snapcaster. It's a little worse with counters, but it's it's so much better because it digs you to these spells and it also kind of gives you the promise of doing multiple things where sometimes you'll like flip it, recast a ponder, and the next one you'll plus one on it, and then you'll plus one it, and then you'll cast something else. And that that's a lot of action. Like I think a good rule of thumb is like my opponent plays a JVP on turn two off just let's say two islands, the most basic case. Right. I still kind of feel like, oh, I got to kill that thing. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. And it feels like it's going to, it could potentially enable broken stuff. And if it's not doing that, it's just crafting their hand to what they want. Okay, let's move to the threes. Our first one is Brazy B, Brazen Borrower, and it's good friend Petty Theft. Another card, it's kind of like Fairy Mastermind. You, you can put it into any blue deck. It's yeah. fine. It's a little better if you're attacking because then you care about having the three one. And you're just happy to have it show up. It covers a lot of bases for you. So it's a it's a totally passable card. And one that I would take reasonably early. Like it's at its best in blue, red, or blue, black. But it's just fine pretty much anywhere. Yeah, the fact that it's non-land permanent means that you can break up a lot of stuff. Like there's a lot of combos. There's a lot of times people cheat something into play and having a brazen borrower to bounce it can be really huge. There's cards that kind of work on a delay like like memory jar or something like that where you just put them in a really awkward position by having access to petty theft. And then you get kind of free rolled the brazen borrower afterwards. And it's a real body. I mean, it, it again, pressuring planeswalkers is something that does come up. Um, you know, the worst time it, it, when you're opposing it is when they don't even use petty theft and they just flash into brazen bar. Cause that usually means it's about to kill a planeswalker or kill you. I like that card a lot. Really good catch all. Uh, next one's gone up quite a bit for me since they put it in in this last iteration, I actually played it multiple times. It's Chrome host seed shark. Oh, it's actually pretty good. Like it, it's weird. What I found is that you really want to take advantage of the extra material on the board. And I don't mean like pain two to wake up the incubator tokens and start bashing, although that can happen later. But I mean like tapping them for mana with Urza or sacrificing them or whatever. But this thing just sort of spits out a whole bunch of board presence every time you have it on the battlefield. Yeah, it, it, it's great. I mean, besides, as you mentioned, the the Mondo combo, which is Academy slash Urza, because it just makes makes it so you make a mock Sapphire every time. You yeah. also just sometimes go, let's say see, you play a Seed Shark on three, they don't kill it. Then next turn you cast a Cryptic Command or, or something along those lines. And, and then all of a sudden you just get two, an Incubator two over the next two turns and you have a 4-4, four, four, you have a 3-3. Three, three, and that's just a lot of value. Like your opponent is going to be in trouble if they don't do something like it. So Seed Shark is the exact kind of card I love, which is good average case scenario of just making some things if they don't kill it and a fantastic like high end where it's like, oh, I just made five tokens and now I'm, you know, re really going off. Yeah. You mentioned Mock Sapphire. It's funny because Mock Sapphire makes a Mock Sapphire in that case. You know, these things, it, your zero cost spells also trigger it. Uh, and you just, if, as long as you don't wake up the token, you still just get a random artifact sitting around and that happens to be more useful than you'd think on average. Also, last but not least, it is a 2-4 flyer, which is a really, it's a really nice middle ground stat line. It doesn't do any one thing super well, but it kind of does, like again, pressures, planeswalkers or life totals, but also it's a good blocker. Like a 2-4 yeah. actually eats up some of the aggressive things that people throw at you. I mean, you play this against mono red and what, what are they going to do? Right. Like, they, they they actually have to do do something here. Their ones and twos get bricked by it, so it's pretty nice. Um, next one, I'm going to put two cards up together: uh, Deceiver Exarch and Pestermite. 
They're generally considered interchangeable uh, because almost exclusively they get played for the Splinter Twin combo or the Kiki Jiki combo, and they rarely get played for reasons outside that. Although you do see them pop up every once in a while as kind of a 23rd card in a blue deck. Yeah, I I think Pestermite's like a little bit more playable in that kind of scenario because it's a 2-1 flyer, so you could nominally play it in, in like an aggressive build. But for the most part, if if I see either of these cards, then I'm going to try to either kill them or have something on deck to answer the twin combo. Because I don't expect my opponent to cast an, a Deceiver Exarch and not have Kiki Jiki or Splinter Twin in their deck. Right. It's it's pretty rare to do so. They're very they're quite narrow cards. They do have cool extra things that they can do, like like untap your your mana vaults or you know your um, whatever you know your your artifacts that tap and then have to cost to untap them again. Things like that you can doesn't happen very often, but you can flash them into untap creatures in combat and and tap down their opposing stuff. Uh, you know it's pretty common to run this thing out on turn three and tap down a land on their upkeep so that you slow down your opponent's development, that type of thing. Um, but yeah, these are almost always uh, combo pieces. Next is Emery, Lurker of the Lock. Where are you on Emery? You've been drafting a lot of art, uh, artifact decks. Do you play Emery? No, I think Emery is another one of those cards on the chopping block where like, yeah, Emery does have like the good use case of like, Land Mox Emery on turn one, Mill of Black Lotus or a Lion's Eye Diamond or, mm-hmm. or just like Basalt Monolith or whatever, mm-hmm. all that stuff. But for the most part, I think that Emery is a very narrow card and not one I'm I'm like very excited to try and play. Yeah. When I'm playing a, a straight up artifacts deck with with Academy and like trying to do the artifacts thing, I'll always play Emery. But sure, outside yeah. of that, I don't. Yeah. It's just a, a more narrow card. Uh, next one's real good. Spellseeker. Yo, Spellseeker. Spellseeker is more like Snapcaster or Jace, even than them, of if I have a good target, I'll get it. Because the rate of three mana for a 1-1 one, one that gets a spell is actually pretty bad. It's bad, the, yeah. The ways to make Spellseeker good are almost exclusively Time Walk, Ancestral Recall, Swords to Plowshares, Reanimate, like the really, really good, the mm-hmm. high-end stuff. And even mm-hmm. getting something like Balance is a little awkward given the, the, the circumstances. The creature, yeah. Mm-hmm. But I would say that uh, Spellseeker is not a card I tend to speculate on very much. But when I have the cards that go with it well, it's a very high pick. Um, similar card in some ways is Trinket Mage. Yeah, that's just exactly the same thing where mm-hmm. Trinket Mage, if if you have the, uh, the the cards to go get, obviously Black Lotus and Soul Ring are the best. But even if you have a Mox, a Mana Crypt, a Sensei's Divining Top, like – the threshold is generally two cards, one of which is pretty good. So, like, let's say you have Mox, Sapphire, and Sensei's Divining Top. Yeah, mm-hmm. Trinket Mage is pretty good there. Yeah. If all you have to get is Chrome Mox and Walking Ballista, I'm not, not that excited. But I've had decks where Trinket Mage has, like, a Mox, a Mana Crypt, a Walking Ballista, and a Candelabra of Tanos to go get. And then, it, you know, you're just, like, you're in the money there. Retrofitter Foundry. It, the other thing is if you have a card that's super important, like a Skull Clamp, a Retrofitter Foundry, a Candelabra in your Academy deck, you could play Trinket Mage just for that, though you would ideally want a little bit more. Yeah, the best ones are when you have a, a really high-end card to get, but then you maybe have two to three extra cards that would be uh, like a little more toolbox, right? Like, you know, think Spellseeker, you know, to go grab Ancestral Recall. But, you know, maybe you also have like a removal spell or a counter spell that you could get. Maybe they're not like Swords of Plowshares and Mana Drain, but you know, whatever, a counter spell and something else. That can be really good too because you're generally just going to go get your Ancestor Recall with it. But in the cases where either that's not going to win you the game or you've already cast it, then you have, you know, some flexibility there as well. And that's true for Trinket Mage too. You mentioned, you know, just in what you said, like card selection, a combo piece, a threat, and mana. Right. Like those are just some of the things that you can get with uh, Trinket Mage. And so you do the best case scenario is something premium to get and then a backup plan of a, like, again, like maybe two, two other things that are different than each other. So you can kind of toolbox it. Uh, last three drop in blue, Vendillion Click. The old school I like Vendillion champ. Click. You know, I, I kind of see the writing on the wall here. Like Vendillion Click's days are 
I wouldn't say numbered. Like, I don't think this card's leaving the cube in, let's say, the next three or four iterations. I'd be mm -hmm. surprised if it did. Mm -hmm. But you, you got to admit, Vendillion's just a little worse than it than it was, you know? Like it is. A couple years ago, just it's in a heavily contested slot, three, whereas like something like Fairy Mastermind costs two, and that's a world of difference. And cards are just getting better. Like, you can now cast Fable of the Mirror Breaker or Lelia for three mana. And really, it just does not compare with those cards. It's got a couple things kind of keeping it around. One is that uh, it's a legend, so Caracas Vendillion Click is actually a really potent combination. Mm -hmm. The other is that I imagine at some point Hole Breacher is going to be back in the cube. Fairy Mastermind's in the cube. Leovold, Narset. It, it's got, like, these little minor combos with the, like, the draw denial stuff. And it's good in the blue-red or blue-black aggressive decks where you're just like, you know, turn two Thieving Skydiver, turn three Vendillion Click, Bolt you Snapcaster Bolt. Like, that, that's a pretty effective plan. Yeah, it, it, I have it in that same category as, like, good blue card you can put into most blue decks, but doesn't do anything particularly special, you know, because, you know, like Brazen Borrower is similar. But like we talked about Chrome Host Seed Shark, it combos with Urza, it combos, you know, with anything that cares about artifacts, basically. That's pretty sweet. Deceiver Exarch and Pestermite, they have combos with, uh, you know, Kikijiki um, and uh, Splinter Twin. You know, Emery is a highly synergistic card. And then we talked about the Searchers with Spellseeker and Trinket Mage comboing with a whole bunch of different stuff. But like Click and Borrower, eh, you know, there's some nice yeah, little value fine. you can get here and there and they're good cards, but yeah, they're, they're, they have a little they're, bit lower of a ceiling. They're not doing anything like irreplaceable or especially broken. Exactly. Like, both of these cards, two mana to bounce, three mana for a three, one, totally fair. Three mana for a three, one that also like disrupts their hand, but doesn't even put them down a card. Like it replaces it. Pretty fair. What do you think the goat is for the three drop oh. category? Is it the seed shark, shark for you now? Yeah, yeah I yeah. knew you were going to say that. It Look, definitely has the highest ceiling. Well, I should say well, Exarch no. and Pester might have the highest ceiling, but... I actually think Spellseeker is the highest ceiling, because when Spellseeker is a backup Ancestral or Time Walk, like, that's that's a, a whole other level. But if you were to ask me, which you you have to third pick one of these cards. You don't know what your first two picks are. I mean, you've seen me draft. Seed Shark's probably the, the one that is going to be mm -hmm. the overall best in, in that sort of scenario. Yeah, no, I think so too. I think it it has the highest upside of the newer cards, and you know, I don't know, even even Spellseeker. Like, if you go get Ancestral, it's really good. But I mean, you're still paying two blue blue for a one one and three cards. Like, you do that all day. It's not, I don't know, that that's not as exciting as just ripping an Ancestral and you know casting it plus another really good spell in the same turn or whatever. Okay, let's go to the fours. Uh, first one. Relative newcomer, but uh, it's starting to get some shine. It's a uh, Displacer Kitten. Yeah, this card's awesome. So it's three and a blue for a two two. And whenever you play a non creature spell, you can blink. You can exile, then re immediately return into play one of your non land permanents. Yeah, and that's key, right? It's not creature, it's non land permanent. Yeah. And uh, there's a couple like really easy infinites with this. One that I did a bunch was uh, Tamio, the the blue green planeswalker that has minus three return a card from your graveyard to your hand, plus either Black Lotus or Lion's Eye Diamond. Mm. With Displacer Kitten is infinite mana because you play. Let's say you play the Lotus, you sack it for three mana, you minus three Tamio, get it back, you play it. Kitten blinks Tamio, you get to use it again. So Kitten plus any planeswalker means every non-creature spell lets you re-trigger that planeswalker. So. Kitten plus Planeswalker is a big combo. Uh, another one I've liked is Candelabra of Tanos, mm -hmm. where every time you play a spell, you get to untap, you get to pay one and tap and untap a land, which starts to get busted when you have Talarian Academy as the best land. But Guy's Cradle is a secondary one, where every time you play a spell, you get to untap your land that taps for five mana or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that goes pretty hard. Displacer Kitten, Eternal Witness, every time you play a spell, regrow something. So the combo there is like Time Walk or Time Warp. You could just take infinite turns. Mm -hmm. Well, infinite as long as you can play a non-creature spell every turn, which is usually pretty easy to do. Um, especially since the casting the Time Walk blinks the Witness, gets something else back. Right. Then on that, something else casts it. You know, you just need any other spell there, you know, sorcery. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Overall, I mean, Displacer Kitten, like, you can also blink, like, Mana Vault or Thran Dynamo to get a bunch of mana every time you play something. So it's a very narrow card. Like, you have to have 
a sufficient amount of these combos to want to play it, but it, you know, you want to talk about high end. It's not going to be the goat of this category. I think we both know what that's going to be. I already know but, what it is. Uh, <laughs> Starts with Displacer, a U. <laughs> yes, Displacer Kitten is one that I, I do enjoy playing with. Yeah, this one has a lot of cool space. And, you know, we didn't even talk about just value blinking, like creatures, ETB abilities, that type of stuff, too. Like, you can just do that. Just play it out. I blinked Fable the Mirror Breaker once. You're just getting a 2-2 oh. Goblin every time you play a spell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there you go. Resetting sagas is insane so yeah it, the downside to it of course is that it absolutely must be supported like this is not put this into any random blue deck <laughs> it's a four mana two two that a lot of decks won't even want in play right exactly so be careful but the upside's really high uh next which you could argue that this could go in the three drop slot um is phyrexian metamorph it's a great one uh metamorph the fact they can copy artifacts is pretty nice because sometimes that does come up and it's also colorless, so it's a really easy pick to speculate on early. Like, I love this card in, like, my red aggro decks or white aggro decks because, like, sometimes you have good things to copy and you get to free roll off your opponent's stuff. You get to steal games by copying, in, like, an Inferno Titan or something out of nowhere. It, plus, it's an artifact for, like, the Academy-style decks. So Metamorph's good. It, yeah. This is one I will – because it copies artifacts, too, I don't think I've really cut this from a deck. Like, yeah. I won't always draft it super highly, but – Almost every deck, I think, can just make room for the metamorph. Yeah, and, and the fact that it can be colorless just means it, it just jams in. Uh, next is old school. Is it still worth it? Sower of Temptation. This is another one on the border where if you if you were to tell me, hey, the next iteration they cut Sower, I would not be surprised nor shed a tear. I find this to be a sideboard card more than anything else. Yeah, me too. It's good against like green decks, but it's almost exactly that. Like. It's not good against red decks. They just cast Firebolt and kill it for one mana. Mm -hmm. It's not good against white decks most of the time because they usually have some removal. Though it's, a, it's okay against white, actually. Sometimes mm -hmm. sometimes you'll play against a white weedy deck that doesn't have Swords to Plowshares. And then yeah, Sower can be good. Sower has, from the day it got printed, been the kind of card where if it sticks, you win. Because mm -hmm. you spent four mana, got a 2-2 two -two flyer and their best creature. But... It just doesn't stick that often, and even in cube, there's some. Sometimes you just play against a deck that doesn't have any good targets. I love siding it against show and tell reanimator style decks, though. It can yeah. be really good there. I don't think Eureka's in the cube anymore, but that was always funny too. Um, next is another relative newcomer, part of a full cycle that made it into the cube. This is subtlety. Yeah, this one's this one's good. I like subtlety. I even use it as an example of a card I wouldn't mind taking early because four mana three three flyer that like you know gets to disrupt their planeswalker or creature is pretty good and then having the pitch version is really nice i've had a lot of decks that have like draw sevens where you just subtlety their two drop then cast wheel of fortune you didn't the fact that you traded two cards doesn't matter you just got a good deal from doing that so yeah and it's like also subtlety. good if you wheel of fortune into it plus a thing to stop them totally. from getting yep, started exactly yeah. it's good on both ends of that so subtlety mm -hmm. is just a great card i think in just about every, every yeah deck. to me this is like the fair version of these this evoke cycle but they're not really fair. <laughs> like free spells aren't fair under any circumstance. So this one still definitely holds its weight. Oh, here he is. <sighs> Our boy Urza, Lord High Artificer. Oh my God. This card has been really cool since the day it made it into the cube and it has done nothing but get more interesting and more powerful as time has gone on. Yeah, I love Urza. It's one of my favorite cards. There's basically three different things that kind of work all the work together it's urza Telerian academy as like all my artifacts basically produce a mana and then guys cradles like a sub like the, the worst version of those two mm -hmm. but when i when i get an urza or an academy early which is basically means do i see them early because i always take them <laughs> uh, uh -huh. i just look how can i put a bunch of artifacts into play because right now there's retrofitter foundry there's you know third path iconoclast chrome host seed shark when i can do that Look, here's my new cube philosophy, and, and if you've been watching the videos on YouTube, you can very much see this in action. I look for busted ways to generate mana. And look, if you open a Mox or a Soul Ring, great. You, you, you kind of get to do that without working at it. But for those of us working without power, uh, <laughs> one of the more reliable ways, though, as you've mentioned, I, I do get past this a lot less. No, the, the days of fifth pick to learn academies are, are behind me. What... You can use Tolerian Academy or Gaia's Cradle or Urza alongside these artifact token makers to just make a ton of mana, and then it doesn't matter how you win. Sometimes it's Brain Freeze and Time Twister and all that. Sometimes it's Upheaval. 
Sometimes it's just activating retrofit or foundry a bunch of time and casting cryptic command or, or whatever. Like it, my, my philosophy has always been that wing conditions are like the least important part of the puzzle. And it's just even more so now. My theory and one that I believe is true at this point from many, many cubes that have done so many. If you can tap to learn Academy for five mana, you can find a ton of different ways to close out the game. It yeah, doesn't matter what it is. One of them, interestingly, is Urza. <laughs> right. Urza actually is both at once where you yeah. just start spinning Urza and then you hit something. That's but right. When I get an early Urza, I, I, there's a lot of ways to maximize it. And one of the best parts of Cube is when you have these like kind of complex interlocking webs where you have 15 cards in this kind of category and most any combination of three to four of them leads you down a good path. Reanimator is kind of like that, where if you're like, well, Entomb's the best, you know, put a creature in the graveyard spell and reanimate's the best reanimate. But if you have Animate Dead and Exhume and Collective Brutality, then you can get something going, Una's Prowl or whatever. You know, if you have Sneak Attack through the Beach, Emrakul, then all of a sudden Channel becomes good. And all that stuff together really works. And there's... Partially because of new cards, you know, new as in the last couple of years, like Urza, Chrome Host, Seed Shark, recent additions like Candelabra, you know, Third Path Iconoclast, all that stuff. You you can end up in the, I'm, I'm going to put a bunch of permanents into play and I'm going to use those to make mana. Tireless Tracker making clues plus Fastball plus Urza or Academy is also another yep. one. I've done that many times. Like, you, this is a deck you can draft towards and when you when you get there... Yeah, you generate so much mana that you're able to usually win the game without too much trouble. So, unsurprisingly, Urza is going to be the glue of this category, yes. and uh, it's a card I just love playing with. Um, is Winter Orb still in the cube? I think Winter it Orb maybe is got... in some versions. It's yeah. not in the. It wasn't in the latest Magic Online cube. Okay. Because that's it, a that's a that's a combo that's uh, maybe a little too cute for its own good, but it is powerful when you get it down. Basically the winter orb only cares, only has its ability, its effect on the board when it's untapped. So you can actually tap the winter orb itself for mana, which you might even be able to use um, on your opponent's end step. And <clears throat> when it comes to you, your stuff will untap it as long as you tap it again, before sending the turn back over to your opponent, their stuff will stay tapped and yours won't. And yeah. you're even making extra mana. Last four drop is Venser Shaper Savant. This is one of my favorites, but admittedly, these type of effects kind of fall into that middle ground, you know, the Brazen Borrower, Vendillion Click range where, like, they're fine cards. I think Venser is a good magic card. It has some cool combos with, uh, you know, things like Displacer Kitten and Caracas and stuff like that. But ultimately, these are the more like bread and butter cards rather than the premiums, you know, like Urza. I think Vincer's hanging on thanks to Caracas, like in large mm -hmm. part. Mm -hmm. And it's flexible. It's fine. It's never exciting. It's it's the same as Vendillion Click. Where, I mean, I actually think Vincer's a little bit better because Vincer has a good effect on the board and blinking Vincer is still pretty strong, all that stuff. But yeah, the, the you know, the, there will be a day when Vincer's not quite there and I think it's close, but yeah. still a good card. The hallmark of these is that they're kind of good in all, they're good enough against all the archetypes, right? Like you can play Vencer against mono white and have it do something. You can play it against combo and have it do it something you can play right. it against control. Uh, but yeah, the, the goat for this particular grouping is definitely Urza Lord high artificer. There are currently two six drops in the, uh, in the vintage cube and they both kind of suck actually uh, frost Titan and torrential gear Hulk. These are both just super replaceable, super like, mediocre. Yeah. I've had fun with gear Hulk with Misha's workshop and like paradoxical outcome. And there's some cool stuff. Uh, magma opus is a fun one as mm -hmm. well. And that justifies gear Hulk in my mind. I think frost Titan should just get cut. I think that card's terrible. Like I think I just, so too. Yeah. The, the thing enough. I like about frost Titan and it is that, it does fill the middle gap on the blue black reanimator decks between a card that is decent enough to reanimate if you can get it on turn one or two. But if the game goes a little longer, if you have a slightly more controlling, less all in version, you can still just cast a frost Titan at some point where the, you know, seven, eight mana cards are sometimes out of reach for that. Um, but it just, to me, it just isn't that exciting really at either spot. Like it doesn't win you the game if you reanimate it, you know, or cast it. And uh, there's usually much more powerful things to be doing. Torrential Gear Hulk is maybe a little bit better than Frostite. It has some cool combo stuff as far as, uh, or I should just say some great like synergy stuff yeah. with getting really expensive um, instants. But I mean, 
I don't know. Th- these are cards that pop up in the screen and I, I hardly even see them. You know, I just. That's because it doesn't matter w- how you kill them, whether it's a, with a, you know, Frost Titan or Holebreaker Horror or whatever. It, if you can generate six, seven mana, then you're you're in, in good shape. Like yeah. that's, that by itself is enough. Um, I, you know, Consecrated Sphinx is like exactly <sighs> the same as these two cards, basically. <sighs> like. Maybe, maybe slightly worse because it's not quite as effective on the board right now. But like if you ha- – if I don't really care which of these are, are in the cube and I think all of them are kind of mid. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add the next two as well, which are a sev- technically both seven drops, Holebreaker Horror and Murktide Regent. Holebreaker Horror it, to me is the exact same as Frost Titan, Trenchal Gear Hulk. It's a replaceable, mediocre finisher. But what about Murktide Regent? At least you can cast it for less. Is there – Blue red deck wants it or something. I, I really wish Murktide was good. I like the theory of it where it's like, I've got a polluted Delta and a prismatic Vista. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I get to like cast fatal potion and duress and then, and then I'll cast a three mana Murktide. That's like a six, six. Yeah. But in practice, I just don't think this card works out very well. And I'm like pretty down on it. So I think that, uh, Murktide, is, is another card that's just not that long for the cube. Yeah, that's how I feel too. Um, I guess I would pick I mean, Torrential Gear Hulk or something. I whatever. think Torrential Gear Hulk is the highest upside of all yeah. these cards and at least has like the Magma Opus or Mystic Confluence, you know, synergies or, and then you can sometimes cast it off of Misha's Workshop, which is pretty cool, I think. There's two Planeswalkers uh, that are just blue currently. One of them is Narset Parter of Veils. It's a card I actually like quite a bit. There's a lot of draw sevens in the cube, and it combos with all of them. You know, it gives you that one-two punch of play Narset, minusing it to actually find the draw seven, and then assuming that she survives, you cast the draw seven, and your your opponent gets, depending on which one you cast or when you cast it, they get one card, and you get seven. Yeah, Nar- Narset. I mean, Narset kind of justifies herself in any deck that has you know a decent amount of targets. Obviously, if you right. if your deck is especially you know, high creatures, value. it's not good. Yeah. But mm-hmm. it's like a three mana dig through time. If you, if it's not killed, right, you could play Narset yeah. minus two next turn minus two. You looked at eight, got to choose two. Great. And then once you add the angle of like, hey, this cuts off their card draw, but also combos with yours. You get to go, you know, Narset time twister in the same turn. They they go they're down to one card in hand. You've drawn a fresh seven. Pretty cool card. Narset is another one of those groupings where it's like Narset, Leovold, Whole Breacher. When it's in the cube, it's currently not though. It's in the it's in the list we're playing right now, and um, Orcish Bowmasters, and you you have the draw seven Punishers, and then you have like you know, eight different draw sevens. And when mm-hmm. you kind of a plus b it, it's pretty fun. Yeah, I, and I, I like Narset quite a bit for that reason. And then the other one is the old goat, Jace the Mind Sculptor. Yeah, still Jace here. is still here, still trucking, has definitely gotten worse. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think Jace is, is a premium card anymore, at least not in the same way. No, so, but it's still a good card, right? Like this is a place you can put four mana and and expect to up your win percentage. Yeah, I mean, J- Jace is, is a card that I will take. You'll take early, like this isn't a card you're getting seventh pick very often. You're going to be happy when you when you have Jace in a blue deck. It's just, you know, look yeah, compa- at Jace. Compare it to Urza. Com- well, yeah, like I would take Urza in a heartbeat. I'd Me take Babel Mirror Breaker. I'd take Raghavan. I'd take Lelia. I'd take Minsk and Boo. And like Jace right. used to be the high water mark. And then Jace, I mean, what, how many Planeswalkers are better than Jace? Like Oko, oh. Minsk and Boo, and, and Comet, if you play with that one, that's the weird red, white, un- unhinged one. Yeah. Um, are, are, are better. Gr- Grist can, are, is on the list. Can, like there's multiple. You can argue that Grist is better. Some yeah. decks better have Narset. Like, right. It's still my favorite planeswalker. Uh, you're still the goat to me, Jace, but yeah, definitely a uh, lower priority than it used to be. I, I would, I would take Narset over Jace. Um, just straight up in the cube, for example. Okay. Instance. All right. One drop instance. These are in alphabetical order. So the first one, Ancestral Recall. One okay, of the most the <laughs> broken cards ever. Yeah, we'll, we'll lock that in as the goat straight away. Um, it's kind of funny because Ancestral Recall isn't that interesting of a card. It's just pure raw power, right? Like 
any deck that could potentially cast it wants it. And it just does the thing that it says. The only interesting thing to me about it in the draft part is it does lean you towards ways to search it up and ways to recast it over and over again. That's kind of the the only thing that it steers you. Otherwise, it's just exactly what you see is what you get. Yeah, I mean, one of the cool things about Ancestral and Time Walk, for that matter, is that they're busted if you just put them in your deck and can cast them. But you can also like draft Spellseeker, Snapcaster, Jace, like Rin's Prodigy, and and in ways to like really maximize it, which is awesome. Yeah. So we don't have to talk too much about Ancestral. It's one of the absolute best cards in the cube, and it's definitely going to be the goat uh, for this category. Next is Brainstorm. Now, this one actually re- does require a little setup on your on your side, huh? Fetches and stuff. Yeah, Brainstorm is a card that when utilized with, let's say, two shuffle lands and maybe another card or two in your deck that shuffles is going to be vastly better than whatever else you'd be considering for that same mana cost. Like, it just, you know, it leaves all the other cantrips in the dark or in the dust, rather, and mm-hmm. just really strong card for one mana. In a deck that has no ways to shuffle, this is barely playable. Right. So there you go. That's This is the cantrip that has the biggest range. Uh, the other instant speed one is consider. That's a look at the top card of your library. You could put it in your graveyard and then you draw a card. This one's, I think, the worst of all the... Because basically, they're, they're, they're split up on our list here because the, these two are instants and then the other ones are sorcery. They're Gitaxian, Pro, uh, Ponder, and Preordain. But I'd rather have Ponder, Preordain, or Gitaxian Probe over Consider. And then I'd rather have Brainstorm over Consider if I meet the requirements that you said. So to me, Consider is like the bottom barrel for the cantrips of the power rankings on those. Yeah, I agree. It, it, you, you'll play it in any any deck that has access to early blue mana, but it is the worst of all the cantrips. Yeah, it's just cantrips are really good in the Vintage Cube. Next is a combo card, High Tide. So what, what are the things that you look for what, de- what archetypes does High Tide go into and what are the things you use to enable it? So yeah, High Tide is, you know, one mana makes all your islands tap for an extra blue this turn. Or all the great. islands, as it were, yeah. Well, yes, theirs as well. Yeah. Um, great card. It is good with cards that untap your lands. Like that's one mm-hmm. of the ways to like make it do extra extra things. So we're talking cards like Turnabout, Frantic Search, Time Spiral. Treachery, obviously. Yep. Obviously, you want a candelabra is a new one that's also mm-hmm. nice. Uh, yep. Obviously, you want to be in a very heavy blue deck to make this work. So, right. Sometimes, you know, when you're when you're high tiding, it, it can put a strain on your mana base where you're like three or four color storm, but you also want like nine islands in your deck. Right. So that can be that can be tricky. And overall, like it's a card that is a very frequent last pick, while also being a card that sometimes it's like well. I need high tide more than any other card in the cube. Can I please draw this? <laughs> right. So what, what archetypes do you put it in? Storm. It's just, it's a, it's a storm card. It's just a storm card. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's to me, high tide is kind of the classic. Y- y- you'll already know that you want it, <laughs> you know, like you're, you're the one player at the table that really needs a high tide. Uh, next is mystical tutor. Generally, you know, you and I aren't really huge fans of these tutors that put cards on top of the library. You know, they're, they're card disadvantage. But there's definitely room in the world for a Mystical Tutor in oh, the right yeah. deck. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, Mystical Tutor is the the kind of card that it's a force multiplier on your good card. So it's like mm-hmm. Spellseeker. It's a little more committal than Spellseeker in the sense that, like, it's card disadvantage. So you really got to mean it. I'm not Mystical Tutoring for Mana Leak here. But – Unlike Spell Secret, hits a wide range of spells. And when you have a deck that has Time Twister in it, Mystical Tutor is almost always a card you want. When you have a deck with, you know, Wheel of Fortune, Time Spiral, any of those. Or if you have a deck that has like Time Walk and maybe another a good card or two, Balance is a great one to Mystical Tutor for. Mm-hmm. Natural Order in the blue green decks can be really mm-hmm. good. So there, there's a lot of ways to make Mystical Tutor work. Yeah, it also gives you a nice buffer against Ancestral Recall because when people mystical for Ancestral, it's like a decent play, but it isn't quite as backbreaking when when they just like upkeep it on your turn or whatever and blow you out. Uh, I will also reiterate the toolbox nature of Mystical Tutor. You know, if you if you can get a couple of different 
spells that would be good in different scenarios that helps out quite a bit too. But the most often that I see it are the things that you mentioned, Luis, where like you're either getting a spell that negates the card disadvantage. Like if you get a draw seven with it, it doesn't matter that you tossed, you know, effectively tossed a card to get it because you're just going to reload anyway, or in combo decks where you can go get a specific piece. You can go get your high tide. That is the only piece you need to go off or whatever, um, where you're really leaning on the tutor part of that. And then the last blue instant at one drop is spell pierce. Yeah, and Spell Sorry. Pierce is a good card. It I mean, just, I it just is good, what it is. Yeah. yeah, I would even say a good card. I mean, this is this is one of the ways that you can uh, you can really use to uh, kind of punish expensive decks or punish combo decks. So yeah. it, it, it's pretty neat. Yeah, there's a bunch of spells like this that are like very high leverage. Uh, the Goat is obviously Ancestral Recall. Uh, instance at two mana. Brain freeze. All right, do your thing. Go, go ahead. <laughs> Sing so the brain, praises. <laughs> brain freeze is a card that I've really come up on because one underworld breach brain freeze is just a sick two card combo. If you ever assemble those two cards, you basically just win because you cast breach for two mana. You cast brain freeze for two mana. You can at the very least mill yourself for six, mm -hmm. which means if you have extra mana, you can then brain freeze again and that fills your graveyard and then you start brain freezing them. The last piece of the puzzle is at best Lion's Eye Diamond, but even Lotus Petal works. Or in a deck without any zeros, you can still just get up to like six, eight mana and go like Cataxian Probe, Underworld Breach, Brain Freeze myself for nine, Brain Freeze you for 12, Brain Freeze you for 15. Yes. And it's just not hard to do that. Frantic no, Search not. also contributes extremely yeah. well. You mentioned with the mana, you can do Lion's Eye Diamond, Petal, or, or Lotus right? Any, any of those three give yeah. you a, a mana engine that is going to give you enough mana to basically cast whatever you want out of your yard. Um, I've seen you do some kind of creative things with brain freeze as well, uh, targeting yourself to get to Sheldock Isle activation. Yeah. You, um, you can, you can use it to uh, storm as well. Like you can brain freeze into Yogwell. So you go end of turn, uh, they cast two spells. You go like, all right, well, cast an, cast consider, then brain freeze myself for 12. When you already have the Og will in hand, it can be mm -hmm. pretty nice to do that. And then to, to reload and do that whole thing. Um, it is also a win condition in and of itself in just a Storm deck that isn't using Underworld Breach. Yeah, um, it, but, I mean, I've seen this deck or brain freeze be in like a – like I played it in like a Jeskai control deck that just in the late game goes spell, 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 brain freeze you, remand, brain freeze you, or – Brain freeze you for 15. Like, yeah, there, there, are, there are times when, like, there's just finished cube games where they get down to 20 cards in their deck very easily. Yeah. It, it, is it in your mind? Is it, is it the premium storm card at this Definitely. point? Definitely. It's, yeah. it's much better than tendrils. Yeah. The main weakness of brain freeze is that when you are uh, playing against an Eldrazi, you can't actually brain freeze them out, which is pretty awkward. So, what happens then? Because I've seen you win those games, but you always have to do some weird stuff to do so. What's your, what's your secondary plan if, let's say, they're shuffling their deck and they accidentally drop a, an Eldrazi or your teammate tells you, hey, they've got Emrakul. It really depends on kind of what your deck is capable of doing. Sometimes you can like mill your whole deck and then lightning bolt them to death with an Underworld Breach. Like you just chain lightning them six times or whatever. I've seen sometimes, you do that with, uh, yeah. with Lightning Helix. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes uh, you can you can end up putting a bunch of stuff into play and taking a time walk, like imagine the Chrome host seed shark or, or a third path iconoclast where you're like, all right, 27 tokens in play. Now I cast time warp. Sometimes you don't have the time warp. You just put all the tokens to play and say, go with like a counter spell or a turnabout in hand to tap them down. And that's enough. And sometimes you lose game one and have to figure out a way to, to win. Yeah, sometimes yeah. you can force a draw with cards like wheel of fortune. Cause those chunk in groups of seven. So like, you can you, you try to brain freeze them. They have you know they, they reshuffle, but then you're like, all right, well I can cast three wheels of fortune. So as long as it's in the bottom seven, you know, mm -hmm. or the, the last one, uh, then then it, it can actually either be a draw or you lose based on that. So okay, but this is one of the premium combo cards. It is the premium storm spell, and it has a lot of combos as we described here. So don't sleep on brain freeze, and don't forget that you can target yourself with it. That's how most of the combos yeah. end up winning. Uh, next is a much simpler card. It's counter spell. Still good. Yeah. Yeah. Still a good card. You know, you do need to be heavy blue to really take advantage of it in the early game. But, you know, almost any blue deck will play a counter spell. It's just a catch-all for everything your opponent's doing. Uh, Daze. 
How good is Days? I mean, it, it's felt like since the cube has uh, been picking up all the newer cards that make it sleeker, faster, more close to the ground instead of a you know, win condition costing four or maybe five mana. Now they cost three. It feels like Days would be better in a world like that. It is. Days is great. Mm -hmm. I think Days is a fantastic card. Uh, I don't mind Days. But basically, I'll play Days in any deck that has sufficient islands. So we're talking eight or nine islands, hopefully. Yeah. It be, and it is better if you're playing a aggressive deck and you can pressure them and all that stuff. But I think that days overall is really punishing for three, four, five mana spells. And yeah. when you just when you when you're an assertive deck, so it's not actually as good in the control decks. But when you're in like an assertive deck, imagine you're playing uh, something like a blue black deck, and you go uh, tenacious underdog into uh, Vendillion click, and then days their three drop oh. like. Brew, you know, that, that's the sort of thing that can be really good. Yeah. I, I like days. I'll take it fairly early. I think it's I, a I pretty good too. disruptive element. Uh, relative newcomer, or maybe it came back as Flash. I love Flash. Flash has Flash. been really good. It's impressed me. It's number one target apparently is World Spine Worm, but you can do a bunch of stuff with it. Yeah, so Flash is a weird card. It puts the creature into play, but if you don't then pay its casting cost, it immediately goes to the graveyard, which means that the way Flash ends up working is you get the ETB and death triggers of any creature. So it's bad with Gristlebrand. You never get a window to pay seven life. Mm. But it's fantastic with uh, Atroxa because you get the just Atroxa trigger. Yep. It's, World Spine Worm is probably the best. You get three five five worms. Mm -hmm. And then uh, one of the ones that's really funny is uh, Woodfall Primus because it comes into play. You blow up a thing. It dies from Flash but then mm -hmm. persists back into play. So mm. the combo is – you cast Flash with Woodfall Primus, you get a 5-5 five, five and blow up two lands. 5-5 five, five Trample with, and two, yeah. blow up two things? Wow, okay. Which on turn two can can be pretty good. Like that, <laughs> yeah. that, 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 that ends up working out fairly well. Um, I think that Flash is one of the best early picks you can have because of the cards that work well with it. The other thing is it, it also just puts a creature into the graveyard. So... I've had games where I go, end of turn, you know, flash an Archon of Cruelty. So it's like, yeah, they lose three life and discard a card. And then you untap and and reanimate it. Oh, and okay. then that's awesome. And it fits into that archetype with the colors and stuff too. So yeah, lots of really powerful stuff to do with flash. Uh, next is Mana Drain. Perhaps the best counter spell in the cube? Mana Drain, I think, is probably the best one. But honestly, I wouldn't be shocked if it was like the, the second best one. Okay. Uh, it's definitely better than Counterspell. <laughs> and it Force has of Will is, is quite a card. Force of Will is insane. And we'll get to that shortly. Um, but Mana Drain is top is a premium counterspell and a premium card in the cube. It leads to some of the biggest swings. Turn three, turn four, you mana drain what they do, and then you cast a six drop or something on your turn, and it can feel like your opponent can't come back. Uh, mana yeah. Leak, still very good on efficiency. Certainly worth putting into any blue deck. Mana leak's great. Yeah. It's, a, it's even it's even sometimes better than counterspell if your mana isn't isn't top notch because it still just kind of does the thing you want it to do. And it's easier to cast. Uh, miscalculation. Do you have it above or below mana leak? Uh, below. I think okay. I, I'd rather just have mana leak work more often. It is nice that miscalc you can cycle it if you need to, but I would rather just have a mana leak most of the time. But these cards are all good. Like yeah. one of the strengths blue has is like. You don't need to know what you're playing against to have Mana Leak and Miscalc disrupt their game plan. That's right. It's at its they they are at their weakest against one and two mana creatures, which is why Mono White and Mono Red are so good. But Mana Leak is great against the Sneak Attack combo deck, and the Storm combo deck, and the Reanimator deck, and the Blue White control deck. Like it's just good in, across the board. It's part of why Thought Seize is so good. So when you're blue, a lot of the difference between like a good blue deck and a great blue deck can sometimes be like, well, I've got mana leak, days, counter spell, and force of negation. You know, I'm I'm ready. Yeah. Versus, well, I've, I've got a blue deck, but I just have one counter spell. Yep. Like my deck's a little slow. You know, so yeah. When it when it comes to setting up your defenses, Vintage Cube is all about cheap interaction, and blue has that as we've seen multiple cards with days, counter spell, mana drain, mana leak, and miscalc. So far, there's another one here as well, remand. So, yeah, Remand is, is definitely on that same tier of card. Really, really good. You want it in basically every deck. It can really set the opponent back, particularly if they tap out for like a one-time use mana rock or sacrifice. 
you know, a, a man, a, an artifact like a black Lotus or something like that to get it. And then you just snap it back to their hand with remand. Then, and then there's also though, you mentioned that it, it fits into some combos, particularly in the storm decks. But can you explain that with the brain freeze and remand interaction? Yeah. So how, the way it works is you cast brain freeze, the storm triggers, cause that's how the, those cards work. And let's say, let's say four copies of Brain Freeze are now put on the stack. Mm -hmm. You then can remand the original Brain Freeze. So they get milled for 12. And then you cast a new Brain Freeze, which is now going to have uh, an additional two copies on the stack effectively because the remand yeah. is one. And then Plus it, all it's the solved. originals. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a really easy way. If you have six mana and you can cast Brain Freeze, remand Brain Freeze, sometimes if, if let's say they cast two spells on their turn. Yeah. You cast Brain Freeze as the third spell you know, two copies go on the stack. You remand the original, they get milled for six, but then you cast it as now the fifth spell, uh, on mm -hmm. the stack. So now they get milled for another 15. Like, yeah, it's, so that's it's 21 really, cards. Yeah. It's really easy to brain freeze them out with and, remand. And you get a card draw off the remand too. And you do. Yeah. <laughs> so there's something there. Um, so yeah, remand's really good. And then the last blue two drop instant is snap. I like this one. Just because I like any of the untapping things, I think mm -hmm. Snap's pretty neat. Uh, it's a little narrow because you don't really want to play this if you're if all you're doing is 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 uh, just bouncing a creature. You you need right. to, you need some way to like take advantage of it, whether that's having a multi mana land or playing a storm deck or what have you. High tide, etc. Um, is it mana drain or brain freeze as your goat of the category? I think it's brain freeze at this point. <laughs> it, I, it, it, it's a win condition rather than just a, a stop you. That said, man, mana drain is so backbreaking still. Like it's been around forever, but a turn three mana drain into a five or six is still just as backbreaking as ever. I think it's really close. Yeah. Brain freeze obviously makes you work a lot harder. Like you have to draft around it somewhat significantly, but the ceiling is definitely higher. I would still give it to mana drain, but it's close. I think that your fans would uh, really be sad if you didn't give it to Brain Freeze, though. Three drops, technically a three drop, Blue Sun's Zenith. This is an attempt to give payoffs to cards like uh, Candelabra plus Academy or High Tide. Just mill them out. You don't have to worry about the Eldrazi thing. Yeah, and, and it's it's totally fine. Like, it's a good big mana payoff, but that's like, like I've mentioned many times, that's like the last piece of the puzzle that you need. So right. I'm really just not that worried about picking these up. What about force of negation? The baby force. It's not as good as force of will. It's actually mm -hmm. quite a bit worse, but it's still great. And still I still really good. It, I mean, it takes the same, basically same kind of deck to enable them. And in order to uh, put it in your deck, like you just need the same mass of blue cards, but the fact that it can't counter creatures and can only work on uh, your opponent's turn is pretty big. Yeah. And you can play around it on some level too. Well, Julie's just going ham. Um, I, I know she's just, she's just loving the, that dog bed. <laughs> uh, this is a card that came up a couple of times. Frantic search, obviously uh, very good as kind of a glue card for a lot of the combo decks, right? The um, even the reanimator deck loves to see frantic search. It helps you find, the reanimate cards while also putting potentially good targets into the graveyard. It is an untapper for the things that we keep bringing up over and over again in blue. And you can see why Louis said earlier that he really likes to put together huge amounts of mana. Cards like Frantic Search can help because again, if you have an, a Telerian Academy that you know taps for four or five mana, Frantic Search lets you double that up. And then it's the same thing with the High Tide that we mentioned before as well, where you can no, you can pop off, you know, with frantic search. Now it is card disadvantage. Like it, it makes you discard as many as you draw and you have to play the search itself. So this is a card you will not often find in a value deck and a deck that's just trying to like counter their stuff and draw cards and do that, that this isn't the card you want, but in most of the broken decks, we'll, we'll play a frantic search. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's kind of like snap, but even more, uh, kind of leaning that direction where mm -hmm. unless you're doing something kind of ridiculous, like in some way, like some sort of synergy thing, frantic search is just a bad card. Right. It's a zero mana faithless living. That's just a terrible card to put in like a blue white control deck. Mm -hmm. But there's so many things that it works with that I don't mind speculating on it early. You know, the multi mana man lands. It's great. Right. When you untapping academy or cradle, um, 
It's great when you're discarding cards for like a reanimator deck. It's good with Underworld Breach. Like it's it's a very strong card. You don't see it going around too late because of how strong it is in the decks that want it. But you could easily be a blue deck that just doesn't want to put the card in it. Right. Uh, last three drop at the instant slot for blue is Thirst for Discovery. Fr- fringe play and reanimator and maybe a couple of others, but I've always been underwhelmed by by Thirst for Discovery. I, th- this is a card I wouldn't mind seeing it leave the cube. No, this one I think is a little a little below the curve. Like I, I don't think yeah. I don't think this card's good enough anymore. Uh, I would say Force of Negation is the goat. Yeah, for those, I, I I think it's pretty pretty clear. There are four four drops here. Cryptic Command, hard to cast, but still good in virtually all scenarios that you can cast it. Yeah, this is one of the rewards for being heavy blue. Yeah, and cryptic's great i i don't take it super early for the the that exact reason like that it is kind of hard to cast but it's a card that i i certainly am happy to put in any deck that can get reliably get triple blue yeah it's fairly self-explanatory um you know there's different scenarios for each of the two modes and they all work really well most of them include draw a card um fof factor fiction still in the cube is it still holding its own? This is one of the older cards. This is a card that, you know, used to have a lot of cachet to it, but is definitely below the bar compared to what it used to be. But does it hold its own still? Yeah, it's, it's, it's hanging on by a thread. Like, yeah, that's how I, I feel. I, too. I think, I think Foff could easily go like Foff is another one of those cards where it's like, yeah, when you've got a mana crypt, when you have two moxes, when you have like a good Academy deck, when you have, you know, the hard part, which is the, the mana, it is a good way to use that mana. And this mm-hmm. is, again, why I always prioritize mana. Once I have, let's say, you know, you've seen me draft this deck so many times. I've got an Academy. I've got, a uh, let's say, one real Mox plus a Mox Diamond, a Candelabra. I've Give got a you a Retrofitter. You have the Retrofitter. Yeah. You got it. Yeah, yeah I, I have all that stuff, right? At that point, yeah, Foff is a card I'm interested in because it's yeah. like, well, I, I need Foff or Sail into the West or, you know, maybe Torrential Gearhulk, Mystic Confluence, that sort of thing. Like, as long as I have uh the mana then there's a lot of ways to win so yes if you took out Foff, dig through time mystic confluence thirst for discovery a bunch of cards that i think are like you know on the borderline or whatever um well maybe mystic confluence isn't on the borderline but if you take out a bunch of the 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 more borderline cards then i i could see you would end up where oh i've got a ton of mana nowhere to go but we're not really in danger of that and I think Foff is a totally fine card to have in the cube. I don't think it's a card that I'm going to almost ever take early or even really feel like I'm missing when I don't have it. Yeah, the, the, there's a couple of interesting things about Factor Fiction. One is that the other cards go in the yard, so you'd think that that would help, but it usually doesn't. And then otherwise, it's just raw power, right? It's just like, give me cards, right, in in a quantity, either two really good ones or three pretty good ones. I mean, it's cube. All your cards are pretty good. And, uh, and factor fiction is an interesting card to play. Like it's a challenge for the opponent to make the piles and stuff. Um, next is another combo piece. I'm not sure how well it fits in the cube. It's PO paradoxical outcome. I I like this one. It works pretty good. Draws you a bunch of cards. Yeah. So I, I like this one specifically with, uh, the, the really cheap artifacts that kind of make it so it's mana neutral or even positive. Like, Obviously, if you get, you know, Soul Ring and Moxes, that's the best. But, like, Grim Monolith, Mana Vault, Helm of Awakening to make everything cheaper. Like, one of my favorites is P- is going Gear Hulk, P.O., Gear Hulk, and, and bouncing <laughs> the Gear Hulk. Uh, P.O.'s a little fancy. Like, yeah. I would say you can – if you're blue, you're still, like, 10% to want this card in your deck, maybe less. Like, obviously, a, a lot of the times I do draft decks that that try to make this work, but – most of the time, I, I think PO is kind of a miss. So I like it in the cube. You can't have – it's like high tide. You can't have too many cards in that realm because otherwise you open a pack. It's like kind of a bummer to open a pack and look at like five blue cards and still feel like you can't actually take any of them. Right. But, you know, some amount of those I think is pretty fun. Yeah, I feel like I – backdoor my way into paradoxical outcome like i don't take it and then try to draft around it because most of the cards that work well with it are just the high value high desirability artifacts that make mana that you know it's not like you're taking them because you have paradoxical outcome right. you're taking them because they're good. it's a bit of a win more card right it's, yeah, a, it's a bit exactly. it's a bit of a it's a bit of a card that it's like 
if if you have everything good, you know, this card's awesome. And it's like, yeah, the, there is a there is a pl- time and a place for those cards, but it's still not uh, the kind of card that uh, I think is critical to be in the cube. Last four drop instant and the uh, for blue is turnabout. Yeah, Another combo enabler. Card. Mm-hmm. If you if you can you know generate a lot of mana from your lands or in some cases your artifacts, you can untap it. Turn about one of the few reasons that like you could even justify mana flare or heartbeat of spring in the cube, even mm-hmm. though I think those I think those cards are on their way out too, to be honest. Yeah, they're just too bad when you have to pass turn. Turnabout has some flexibility. You can tap down your opponent's team to stave off death or clear away an alpha strike uh, if you do happen to have some creatures around. Um, it's a flexible, interesting card, but it's pretty narrow and ultimately a combo combo piece. What's the goat? Cryptic, Foff, PO, or Turnabout? I'll say, I would cryptic. say cryptic. Yeah, yeah. cryptic's sweet. Um, Force of Will. The five drop slot at instant, by the way, is pretty stacked. There's only two, but it's Force of Will and Mystic Confluence. We, we, could, we could bundle and dig through time too as like the, the expensive okay. slot, basically, kind of like we did with the, the creatures. And so, okay. yeah, we've got Force of Will, Confluence, dig through time. And Force of Will is just so good because it, again, is a way to generate mana. Like, obviously, it doesn't literally generate mana, but it lets you trade zero mana for their spell on the stack. And yeah, you're getting two for one, you know, mm-hmm. you're, you're pitching a card, but Oh man, is it worth it? It is. It is just really, really good. As you said, it's it's the best counter spell in the cube. So there you go. Um, and then Mystic Confluence, you know, this is an interesting one because it, it it does have some similarities to to cards like uh, even like Thirst for Discovery, Factor Fiction. These, these kind of you know value producing cards, but this one's really worth it. Like th- this is to me Mystic Confluence kind of. If you can get to five mana, it does the thing that you need it to do, right? On end step, you can draw three cards. You can keep yourself alive by bouncing a couple creatures and drawing a card. Um, Or if you just need to counter something, I mean, you can make them pay nine mana. There's not too many things that are going to get around that. Yeah, And of course, you can do combinations of each of these. I mean, the max flexibility is really where this card pays off. And I think that uh, Mystic Confluence is a card that... It's not only flexible in game where it's like, do I want the bounce, the draw, the, the the mana leak or some combination thereof. It's also flexible in draft where it's like any blue deck is just pretty happy to have this card. doesn't really matter which one it is. And I think Mystic Confluence is a, is a very safe early pick as a result. Yeah, it's a stretch to get to five mana. But when you do, this thing basically is good in every scenario. And then uh, we'll bundle and dig through time here as well, because even though it's technically an eight, you never actually pay eight for it or very rarely. Uh, I actually very rarely play dig through time at all. It, it basically never makes a cut for me. Uh, do you play a little more than that? Yeah. I mean, it competes with Breach and Yogwell and reanimate stuff. So like there's a lot of decks that kind of naturally don't fit in. Mm-hmm. And then you have to have a very specific deck. I, I don't mind it being in the cube. So the, the way that this, this is kind of like a Merktide region, but one that actually works because not even every deck wants a random six, six flyer for three mana or whatever. Right. Whereas with dig through time, any deck that's good at putting cards in the grave, are pretty happy to cast a two or three mana dig. Like yeah. that, that is a good deal. So I think that uh, Dig Through Time, it's good in a deck with like fetch lands and ch- cantrips that's not using its graveyard otherwise. So I've had like blue-white decks that have a flooded strand and a, and a polluted delta, add a, a probe, a consider, a swords to plowshares, and a remand. And all of a sudden you're like, yeah, I'm going to cast a reliable two to three mana dig at the middle to late game. And that's that's fine. I still think that they should just choose between Treasure Cruise and Dig. Like I just don't need both of them. Uh, but of this of this group, Force of Will is definitely the goat. Although Mystic Confluence is good, I really like that card. But Foff is or Force yeah. of Will, excuse me, is just too good. Okay, some sorceries, one artifact, technically not, but we'll count it, and then a few enchantments, which are actually really interesting too. And then we'll call it good here. First sorcery up is Gataxium Probe. Man, very busted card. Like yeah, the fact broken. that it takes two life to cast means you can put this into any deck. I I wouldn't put it in like a green deck that doesn't have a lot of interaction because it just, you know, unless you have combos, in which case you do, which is like Oracle will die and Corsair is a combo. Clears out your top card so you can hit more land drops. It's obviously great in any storm deck, but it's even just good in control decks. One of the things I've thought about a lot is a, is a conversation we had where you're like, you know, when you have Tide Hollow Skull or Gataxian Prid, you win a lot more because like right. you look at their hand and then you're just like, 
oh, you've got a sweeper hand, or oh, you've got a mana leaking hand, or even just, oh, your hand has dismember and this four drop and whatever, it's very easy to like sequence to make those cards worse once you know about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I, I will say that, you know, for normal people like me and the listeners, like we can see the big red flags. Okay. you got a sweeper. I'm not going to play into it. You got a counter spell. I'll wait. But for you, I've seen you just play circles around people. Once you know other cards where you're like, well, they're not going to do this. And I don't think that, you know, and you're, you're making bets. Like you're saying, I don't think that they'll counter this one. Yeah. And then you're like, okay, go, you know, and they're like, Ugh, you know, and you, you force people into these really awkward positions over and over again. Uh, it makes probe really good. Like it is not the same thing as the other cantrips in the sense that like, it doesn't dig more than one card deep into your library, but man, that information, being able to see what your opponent's up to can really be a game changer depending on the archetype that you're playing. You will often play things that have some amount of reactive spells, but they're kind of precious few. So you need to really know what to hit with them. Like you can't just fire them off on the first thing your opponent plays. Cause it's like the only one you have. And you're also playing decks that often have a critical turn where they kind of go off or do a big, powerful thing. And you need, you need to know, I need to push this now, or I'm going to lose, or I've got three more turns and I can kind of set myself up I mean, with more resources. One of the most painful feelings in life itself is getting Gitaxian <laughs> probed when you have a daze in your hand. <laughs> oh, it's so bad. I mean, you should just side it out after that, right? Yeah, what are you going to do? Uh, uh, ne uh, next is the the blue Draven Inspector. Inspector. Yeah, Draven hard Inspector. evidence. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love this card. I actually think this is a staple. Like, this should not be. Mm. If I had to make a list of, like, 10 cards to leave blue, this wouldn't be on the list. I wouldn't even, probably not even crack the top 15. And okay. it, it's funny because it's a very unassuming card. But what I like about it is it gives you an early blocker. It enables both Polar and Academy and Guy's Cradle equally because it gives yep. you a, a, a creature and an artifact. Uh -huh. It's good with Tinker. It's just a good card. It's, it is. It's awesome. I, yeah. I, I, I love it. I, I love hard evidence. It's not the best one-mana card because we actually we still haven't gotten to that because next up we have Ponder mm -hmm. and Preordain, and they're both very similar, so let's talk about them both. Yeah. Ponder lets you see the most cards. It lets you look at three, and if you don't like them, you can shuffle. So it's like basically looking at four cards with – Minus whatever probability of seeing the the one of the original three. Right. The 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 downside of ponder is if you don't have shuffle effects, it's not as extreme as brainstorm. It's like brainstorm's like all the way on the extreme where it's like if you've got shuffle effects, this card turns into mini ancestral, and if you don't, it's one mana draw card, very terrible. Right. Ponder's like kind of in the middle where it's like, well, if you have shuffle effects, you get to pick the best one or best two, and then shuffle the others away. Great. But if you don't have shuffle effects, you can still look and you're like, wow, this top three is terrible. There's no lands in it. I can just shuffle. Right. So it's kind of like it's it's, it's the hedging version of Brainstorm, which is it's better if you have shuffle, but it's not like right. amazing if you do or terrible if you don't. There's a reason Preordain is actually the best of all of these, which is funny because it was like probably the least powerful and constructed where you get to put as many fetch lands as you want in your deck. Right. Preordain scry to draw a card. So this one – you don't need a shuffle effect. It just lets you pick, you know, if you don't like the top two cards, bin them both, get a random card. If you do like them, keep the one you want, bin the one you don't. Preordain is the best cantrip in the in the vintage cube. Like, yeah. obviously, Ancestor Recall doesn't count. That's a busted card. That's a different thing. But uh, if I, early in the draft, want to take any of these cards, I I would take Preordain, not knowing what my deck composition is. Me too. It, it, it It's not that much less powerful than Ponder, in terms of how many cards you can see, you can see three cards deep versus three and a half or four, whatever the math says. But it gives you that flexibility because the worst with Ponder is when you see a card you really want and then two that you really don't, you know, two basics right. and then a, a good card. And it's like, well, do I shuffle scenario. this? Right. And with Preordain, you're like, well, put the bad one on the bottom, put the good one on the top. Or if they're both bad, bottom them both and then you'll draw the good one. So I've taken Brainstorm over Preordain when I have three fetch lands in yeah. a cube deck. But that's just very rare. It's rare. Yeah, Preordain's the best one out of the group for sure. Um, there's two sorceries that are two mana. One of them is Chart a Course, which is funny because it has this air quote downside of having to discard one of the cards if you didn't attack with a creature. But oftentimes, even if you have a creature, you'll do it that way, you know, to get something key in the graveyard. Obviously, the reanimator deck is kind of the prime example, but there's other times when you want stuff in the graveyard. Sure, you got Echo Beyonds in your hand. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just a solid card. I, I never feel bad about it. I played Me it too. in like a blue-green mid-range deck the other day, and it was just like, this is just a good rate card. Yeah, awesome. it, it, is a, uh, it is a tier two cantrip, we'll call it. What, but what's the, the best uh, two-mana sorcery? Yeah, so blue? the goat one is going to go ahead. So preordain one goat for one-drop sorcery, but 
time walk. Now, you said you think this is the best card in the cube full stop. Now, taking an extra turn is a powerful effect if used at the right time or, you know, but sometimes it doesn't feel that strong, right? Sometimes it's it's draw a card, play a land, and it's like, okay, you know, that was fine. Uh, why do you think time walk is better than Lotus, Mox, and Soul Ring, all the other stuff? Because time walk has a ton of synergies. Um, mm -hmm. The first one is regrowths, whether that's eternal witness, literal regrowth, or underworld breach. Those all kind of like let mm -hmm. you regrow and replay time walk. Another one is planeswalkers, because or or really any card that is a turn by turn thing. Palantir of Orthanc, uh, the One Ring, mm -hmm. you know, Oracle of Moldia, planeswalkers. So anything that is like at each turn you have this card provides more value. Time walk is is an awesome multiplier there, and just like. Any deck with a bunch of creatures, it's like cast attack you with questing beast. Next turn attack again, cast time walk, you're dead. Yep. You know, it's really easy. And that's without any of the like really busted combos like Underworld Breach or Yogmoth will, where you get to really like maximize it. Plus you just put it in any deck, it's good. It gets you an extra land drop. So Right. And, and Breach, by the way, lets you cast it and then if as many times as you have the three cards, just cast it again and again and again. And yeah, I've had decks turns, that right? don't have brain freeze, but on eight mana, just go breach, time walk, time walk, time walk. And yeah, you can figure out a way to win yeah. when you have three turns stacked up. So <laughs> yeah. I, I think because of the the ability to maximize it, like I even count something like Urza, Tularian Academy in that list of like each turn you get a lot of value. Yeah, mm -hmm. when you have a land or a card that generates seven mana, the more turns you take, the more times you get to generate seven mana. Right. So I would take time walk, pick one, pack one over any of those other cards I think the hallmark of uh, all the really busted cards is that they're busted to start with and you can make them more busted. Yes. It's not like Flash, which is busted when you combine it exactly with one of five cards in the cube. Black Lotus, Time Walk, and and whatnot is, is, is great. Yes. And and this comes up all the time, right? You, you get yourself in a reasonable board position and you cast Time Walk and it's like the game's nearly over. Your opponent's like, oh man. And then you go Snapcaster Time Walk or Regrowth Time Walk or Jace Fringe Prodigy Time Walk. And all of a sudden you take two turns in a row and the game's just like collapsingly levels of over. So there you go. Uh, obviously the goat in that category is Time Walk. Then we've got two competitors at the three drop slot, Time Twister. So this brings up a grouping of cards that we call the draw sevens that come across in different uh, casting costs, colors, and forms, but they all have the same basic conceit, which is that they draw you seven, they cost you your hand, and they draw you, you and your opponent, in most cases, um, draw seven new cards. Sometimes library or graveyards get shuffled in, sometimes they don't, depending on which one it is. But, um, but Time Twister is the, the OG, it's the first draw seven. Um, it's excellent. Right. I mean, there's a yeah. lot of combos with cards like this that just make it good. And we've actually touched on a bunch of them already. I'm much higher on the draw sevens than I used to be. Uh, there's mm -hmm. just a lot of ways to kind of break the symmetry. Th the first and easiest is when you cast it, when you have no cards in hand and they have five cards in hand, it's yep. like you drew seven, they drew two. So, so the way that normally happens is like fast artifact mana, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the other way is when you're trying to assemble specific combos, like it just lets you see more cards and when you have ways to generate lots of mana, you can make use of all these new cards. Uh, one of the best is um, something like Fast Bond. Yes. Like the, the, the dream draw, right, is Forest, Fast Bond, play four more lands, cast Time Twister, and then yes. you just win the game. And then play <laughs> two more lands. And, then and post Time Twister. Yeah. Um, and then you've also got uh, ways like Time Walk to get you extra things. Like if you go... Time Twister, Time Walk. Now you have a whole set of mana. It all kind of revolves around mana. Yep. You know, Lion's Eye Diamond, Black Lotus but, can but help But there's with others, these. right? There's like Narset and Leovold. There's, that's the other aspect, yeah. which is the Punisher aspect. Of I see, Orcus, I see. Or Orcish, Bowmaster, Narset, Leovold, Hole Breacher if you're playing it, where they either don't get to draw the cards or you punish them for drawing the cards. Mm -hmm. And it's so fun. That's one of the best ways to play. Um I love draw sevens. I think they're one of the most interesting things in the cube. And, uh, and I have time twister very high. I, I always look for it. It's also in the color that wants it the most in blue, you know, uh, wheel of fortune is a pretty good card, but it's off color for a lot of the stuff that's trying to do broken things. And, and time twisters to me, right in that meaty center of the draw seven pile. Uh, the other one is tinker. Are you tinkering much these days? I mean, what are you getting well, with when it? I can, yeah, Mind Slaver. Portal to Frexia that, is the best that, one that, now. That Portal to Frexia has been the, one of the most impactful 
additions. I used to not like Tinker that much. Like mm-hmm. I was pretty low on it. Not not that I would never take it, but like I just felt like Tinker didn't lead to a lot of wins. Mm-hmm. But we've moved past Blightsteel and Bolus Citadel. Those are both fine Tinker targets, but uh, Portal of Frexia is huge. Makes them sack three creatures immediately, and if they don't kill the portal, they lose. And then uh, Triplicate Titan is also like a kind of nice one, wh- which works with uh, Flash and Tinker. Uh, I guess Triplicate Titan is not in the current Vintage Don't Cube. Don't think yet, but, yeah. But it's it's one that I played with a bunch in, in, mm-hmm. in cubes, and I wouldn't be surprised if it made it in. So is Portal the number one target then? Portal's the target I like the most because it's just high upside, fairly low downside. Like, if you go for Blightsteel and they kill it, you lose. If yep. you go for Bulls to Citadel, sometimes it doesn't you don't have enough life or you don't or you just hit a land immediately and you don't do anything. Right. If you go for Portal and kill their two or three creatures, then if they kill Portal, like you still got a board wipe out of it, probably about even on cards. And if they don't kill Portal, you basically just win because you start reanimating a creature every turn. So of these two though, of Time Twister and Tinker, I I, I actually think I give the nod to Tinker. Like I'm more likely to pick one pack one a Tinker than a Time Twister, which I guess is a good tiebreaker, though they're both very strong in the right deck. Time Twister works with more cards. Tinker's a little more specific, but I feel like Tinker's got kind of like higher upside. Like it's hard to make a Time Twister deck great without a bunch of other pieces. Tinker's and like a pieces. two or three card combo if you're if supported. And you're not getting late moxes or fast bonds or or, or orcish bowmasters, whereas if you first pick a Tinker, you could get a seventh pick portal. It's not uncommon to do. Okay. Well, I'm giving it to Time Twister because I just I know that it's more replaceable, but I, there's so many cool combos now in here. Uh, next one is Time Warp. So it's the expensive version of Time Walk. I see you play this a lot too, though. Yeah. I, I feel like when you generate enough mana, Time Warp is pretty good still. And okay. It's obviously much worse than Time Walk, but it's, right. it's a playable. It's All the not stuff we said about like, Time Walk, except for none of it. <laughs> yeah, except you can't do it very easily. But right. it's still, I think, good in the right deck. Um, that's the only five. So we'll group it in with the next uh, chunk of cards. The first one is Echo of Eons. This is an important one. Uh, this is one that's gotten a lot better for me over time, it's particularly after having watched you do stupid stuff with it over and over again. Yeah, it's so it's funny because it's like, Worse than Time Twister, I think, at a base level. Like, if you had asked me which one I wanted, I would just put Time Twister in my deck. Mm -hmm. But because it is a flashback Time Twister, if you have enough discard outlets or self-milling, it actually can be better than Time Twister. Like, in your Brain Freeze Breach deck, sometimes it's nice that you know that, like, worst case scenario, if you Brain Freeze yourself for enough, maybe you'll find an Echo of Eons. Mm -hmm. You can discard it to Faceless Looting or Fable or what have you. And it's great with Lion's Eye Diamond. It actually turns Lion's Eye Diamond into a Black Lotus. Like, you can just go land Lion's Eye Diamond, sack it for blue, discard your hand Echo. Mm-hmm. And you don't have Echo in your deck anymore because it's exiled now, but you got a whole fresh seven and got to land into play and maybe something else as well. So I like Echo of Eons a lot. Very high upside card. Me too. The next card I don't like very much, it's Mind's Desire. No, this one I think is one of the weakest payoffs because it's a storm payoff that also costs six. Right. And you have to do a bunch of spells first. You can't just flop it down for six mana so i'm pretty low on mind desire there's some decks i'll play it in and it's good with dream hall specifically but most of the time i think mind desire is kind of weak the one thing i like that it does is if you have a like a dream halls deck with a bunch of expensive things it does cast them and so like you could even get like the cast trigger off and it'll draws you which i've done before yeah i just wish that mind desire there's just if you're going to pay six mana for something it it should be more guaranteed yeah than my stars this next one i love though is time spiral this is the best of all the draw sevens right. because high in initial investment, but it effectively ends up being, if not free, at least only one or two mana. And then in the good scenarios, of course, generates mana. You you, you tap your academy and three other lands for nine mana and you cast times probably you're up three mana on the deal and have a fresh set of seven. It's just a great card because it untaps all your lands. So it's like time spiral plus time warp is a very like – attainable dream whereas mm-hmm. time twister into time warp is just not going to happen very often so. yeah i mean this is the buckle up card right like somebody yeah. goes you know high tide time spiral and it's like oh boy <laughs> you know like i'm probably not winning this game you know like if i had to put a put them on a scale of like how likely am i to play them time spiral i'll play in most of my blue decks because as long as you're doing something unfair ish whether that's sneak attack or deceiver xr kiki um uh, 
storm, whatever it is, time spiral is good enough. Even just having a time walk is enough. And like, yeah. like I've played blue green decks with a bunch of creatures, time walk and time spiral. Yeah. Echo of Beyond is the one I'm least likely to just put in a random deck. So right. I, I think that yeah. time spiral is awesome. Uh, next one is another heavy hitter, uh, upheaval. Upheaval is like a paradoxical outcome in the sense that it rewards you for having the high picks like Mana Vault and Sol Ring and Moxes and, and all that nonsense. Mm -hmm. But unlike paradoxical outcome, it does actually win you the game. If you cast Upheaval with like three mana floating and some cheap stuff to play, you're probably going to win. Their, yes. their, their, their turn one is most of the time land, discard five cards, go. And then right. by turn two, <laughs> you've got a bunch of stuff. Great with fast bond, great in green decks like that's one of the one of the win conditions for like the green elf decks that just have a ton of mana like cradle and elves and a bunch of mana generation. They just go upheaval, replay all my stuff. So yep. a little bit of a win more card, but it is a finisher in draft. It's actually like a legit finisher where my storm deck that has no win condition, upheaval until like anything is good enough usually. Yeah, because it it actually does solve all problems. Yeah. The fact that it bounces all the lands does that. Um and then last is Treasure Cruise, which is Really similar to Dig Through Time. I think it's a lot worse than Dig because it doesn't assemble mm -hmm. combos very well. So yeah. I, I actually don't mind Treasure Cruise. Like we don't have it in our current version of the cube and I think I it's think, a, I not, think it not missed. Go. All right. What's the goat from Time Warp, Echo, Mind's Desire, Time Spiral, Upheaval, and Treasure Cruise? It's Spiral. Time Spiral. Right? Yeah. It's not even close actually. Like I think that, you know, a, a, or a Mind's Desire is clearly the worst. Treasure Crew is also pretty bad. All the rest of them are pretty good if you generate mana, but Time Spiral is good Kind of with the, the the widest range of cards, and it has the highest ceiling, except maybe upheaval. Maybe upheaval is a slightly higher ceiling. But yeah. either way, Time Spiral is the goat. Um, they have the Mock Sapphire in the artifact slot. Uh, we'll, we'll cover that with the artifacts, though, um, when we get to those. Enchantments. There's four, and they're really interesting. The first one is Opposition. This used to be a, a, one of the more feared cards in the cube. Mm -hmm. It's gone down a little since then just because it's – so specific and there's just a lot more powerful stuff going on but if you can combine this with token makers it's pretty nice the classic is deranged hermit you know the blue green opposition elves deck yeah you can also now play it with third path iconoclast or chrome host seed shark yep. like those are ways to make tokens monastery mentor lingering souls but it's also a card you frequently will see this with three cards in the pack because no one's just into that it's you need it you need to be able to make tokens and produce double blue not that many decks can do that yeah I, it works well with the green blue elves deck as well if you can just go like elf elf opposition it can get yeah. ugly quick uh dream halls a recent addition love this one because this one's so sucks, sweet uh, it solves one of the problems storm decks have which is mana because dream halls is a card that can kind of you know, in practice, generate 30 mana in a turn. You mm -hmm. go Dream Halls, discard a card to cast Cruel Ultimatum, discard a card to cast Echo Vions, discard a card to cast Atroxa, and, just, you know, you've, that, that, that's already 20 mana right there. Right. I, I like it with just good expensive spells that you can pitch for it. Like Atroxa is so good because you can pitch any card basically to cast Atroxa. I know. It turns and, its gnarly mana cost, uh, you know, in its favor. And Dream Halls is really cool because it, it lets you kind of fuse a reanimator – like flash dream halls plus storm cards and big creatures is like a legit strategy. I really like dream halls. I think it's a fun addition. I do too. It's just fun. Like it is, yeah. it, it is a put on your seatbelt card as well. I mean, if I'm telling you, Hey Marshall, I got a dream halls deck. You'd be like, like, I want to see in. that. Like, what do you got? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, next is treachery. Oof. The, 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 the stock on this one, sell, sell, sell. It, it has, it has this used to be one of the most feared cards in the cube where it's like, Oh man, they had treachery. I second picked that card and you know, or whatever, like this card's great. At this point, I'd say Treachery is past its prime. Like, it's still fine. There's still some games where they, they, they go Treachery on your, like, Titan, and you're like, oh, the, what, how, you know, that, that was a beating. But it's cost five mana to start with. They don't even always have creatures. The games are faster now. I think it's a fine card. I do, it too. It is just... It, it, it's no longer one of like the top 15 blue cards. Yeah. No, but it know, was, you know, that's pretty crazy. It used to be like maybe number four or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and then our last card uh, for the enchantments is shark typhoon. The card that I always want to be better than it actually is. Yeah. This one's a little below the curve. I, I think it's playable cause it's never terrible. It's so flexible, but it's not very good. Like no. the cube, the cube decks I have, I don't want Shark Typhoon in it, and I don't really fear playing against it. In fact, very few decks fear playing against Shark Typhoon. It's That's only right. good in like control mirrors. So. That's right. The, the 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 litmus test I always put on all these cards, 
I don't know why, but the litmus test for me is Lelia. Yep. Yeah, she's a, she's, she's a great new like flag bearer for like yeah. three mana, very strong, has to be stopped, draws a card every turn, gets really big. How do these cards match up against Lelia? And it's yes. embarrassing when you look at Shark Typhoon. Shark Lelia. Typhoon does not pass the Lelia test at or, all. Or Fable, whatever. It's like the same card. Right. Uh, what do you want to give Goat to? Opposition, Dream Halls, Treachery, or Shark, Ty- Shark Typhoon? Oh, Dream Halls. Dream Halls is... is Dream Halls? Okay. <laughs> It, look, all of these. So it is the sweetest. It's funny because it's like opposition and dream halls build arounds only good in specific decks. Treachery, fine in any deck. Shark Typhoon, kind of bad in any deck. Mm-hmm. Dream halls at least has the highest up end, which is yeah. sometimes you go dream halls into magma opus, into time spiral, into tendrils or whatever. Yeah. Okay, that's going to do it for blue. So uh, l- let us know. Uh, you can find us on social media, Marshall underscore LR and Luis's LSV. Uh, what combos you like to do in blue, what, what your favorite cards are, what are the sleeper picks or the cool things that you can do. Uh, used to be the best color in cube. Might still be, but it isn't by as big of a margin, even if it is, uh, it, even if it is still number one. But it's definitely my favorite color to draft in cube, primarily because of the cantrips. I love being able to look through my deck and the more powerful your deck is, the more uh, powerful cantrips get as well. Um, but yeah, check it out. And then the Vintage Cube is going to be coming back soon as well. I can't wait for that. Um, if, again, you want to find us on social media, I told you that. If you want to find the podcast, uh, older episodes and everything is over at lrcast.com. And we want to say thank you once again to our patrons for supporting us over at patreon.com slash limited resources. That's going to do it for this one. We'll see you next time. Since we're talking about cube, I wanted to kind of go over some of the biggest differences between my cube drafting strategy and like kind of philosophy now, as opposed mm-hmm. to a couple of years ago. I think the number one is I used to be firmly against cards that cost three to five mana in a lot of these strategies because it's like either I want all cheap cards, mono red, mono white, you know, black with like duress, thought, seize, dark confidant, or I just want ex- you know expensive cards, primeval titan, consecrated sphinx. I want to. I want to play Mindstone and ramp into them. One of the biggest differences is, like you said, the Lelia test where Lelia, Fable the Mirror Breaker, Minsk and Boo, you know, uh, White Plume Adventure, if you're playing Initiative, these kinds of cards now make it so three and four mana cards pack the punch of six mana cards that that we used to be, you know, acquainted with. So Mm -hmm. way more invested in the middle of the game. Questing Beast is the kind of card I would not have played three years ago. Yep. Now I think it's great. And I put it in all my green decks. You, you might've laughed. I mean, you might, it might've been like, Oh no, this person. Thinks oh yeah. This questing person's beast. on questing beast. Yeah. And now it's like, yep. Questing beast is fast clock. So yep. that's one thing. Um, another is that I have a lot more respect for the draw sevens because there's a bunch of ways to punish them. Like we mentioned, and I'm so much more focused on mana. It used to be that like, yeah, sure. I would play a good Academy deck if I, if I came across it. And sometimes I like drafting storm, all that. But it used to be you could draft a lot of decks that have normal mana production and are just trying to cast a five mana spell, cast a counter spell or two to get there. Now I'm really wanting to push brokenness because I feel like all the strategies have gotten better. You don't often see me drafting like blue black control with fatal push counter spell into factor fiction as a strategy. It's like, can I generate a bunch of clues off tireless tracker and then tap my academy for five or six mana? You know, can I do the same with Seed Shark or Urza right. or what, you know, some combination of those? Or am I going to go, you know, Entomb into Reanimate, still a valid strategy. Yes. Aggro deck, still a totally valid strategy. Green Ramp, a little less so. I like the really busted stuff. So if I can assemble a Cradle style deck, that's one thing. But Lenor Elf into a Sika's Chariot is just not something I'm like that excited to do anymore. And I guess I was always here, but even more so now, one and two mana interactive spells are very, very good. So yeah. lightning bolt, burst lightning, swords to plowshares, path to exile, duress, thoughtsies, fatal push. Like these are your bread and butter, mana leak, remand. And I'm I'm really looking for ways to interact on on the very cheap because the the, the speed has picked up. So just like everything else, cube is optimized. People have figured out better cards, more powerful cards get like every time a more powerful card gets printed, it gets added and something weaker gets pushed out. It's not not a surprise that cube now is more powerful than five years ago. Yeah. Which also sometimes mean older cards get added, which wouldn't have been good or were just missed before. Like, I think Dream Halls could have been in the whole time. Sure. Great that it got found. Now it's in. But something like, 
uh, Candelabra, for example, I think has kind of gotten better as like cards like Retrofitter and Urza and Seed Shark are now powering Academy, which then makes Candelabra better. Right. Like Academy has actually gotten better. It's not just Definitely. that I like it more. It's just gotten better. Right. So it was great. And then it went off and now it's great again. I mean, you can get a good look at this on, in how I draft these cube videos, but uh, I think it's a, it's a new cube world and, I, and I'm loving it. I'm just, I just love a, like solving new puzzles and adapting. So cube remains the best format and uh, I continue to do lots of cubes. I look forward to more of them. <laughs>